what I have for you today is that I'm going to spend roughly 40 slides. Well, you should have slide copies too. There you go, have them around. I'm going to spend just under 40 slides talking about free energy calculation. And then I figure we'll have a coffee break. And after that, I'm going to spend about an hour or so, depending on how much questions you have and how fast I go, talking a little bit about our research. And this is not just to push ourselves. Scientists are pretty good at that anyway. But there are lots of things here that we've gone through in the course, very fundamental things that surprisingly relate to research. I was about to say research performed the last 10 years, but it's really research performed today. So there was one thing. Before I start with the free energy calculations, I actually, today I didn't make a separate slide about the study questions. But last week we talked about drug discovery in general. And all I said that I would just have one question for you. So I would like you to discuss and take me through the drug discovery process. How do you do that in practice? Mm -hmm. So let's take one step back. Sorry. So assu assu assuming that you get hired at whatever, Pfizer, Merck, AstraZeneca, a year from now. And you, now you're part of the drug discovery team. And uh, let's again, we can assume that if it's AstraZeneca, they have a strategic interest in pain. And uh, so where, where do we even start in the company? How do most companies work? What is that they start to go after? Target. Yes. So you have targets, and if you're, if this is related to pain, this might be what type of receptors? Yes. So there are there are special receptors, usually voltage-gated ion channels. There's an entire family of them. Many of them. There is a common type of receptor sensitive to capsicine, for instance. Um, this uh, the uh, the hot compound you have in chiles and everything. So assuming that we let's start and assume that we have a receptor. What would you do? What happens to this drug discovery team? Mm -hmm. And how do you find that out? No, that's not how I would do it. So be careful, I'm literally not asking you exactly, I don't I'm not exactly asking you about things that are on the slides and anything. So in general, uh, because when you, when you have this job, right, the point is not necessarily going to be to repeat certain slides from a course or anything. How would you do? So one, rem uh, remember, one thing in industry, Hopefully, unless you're at a very small company, the drug discovery team is going to consist of more than one person. And you likely have weekly meetings with other teams, such as experimentalists and everything. Right, and how do you typically do that? Yes, but, but, but I'm, again, you're way ahead of me. I think that, so the whole point is that most of the early studies are done experimentally. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're very useful. Uh, you're likely, the likelihood that you're randomly in the lab going to find a chemical is basically nil. But to understand what the channel does in the first place, you typically need experimental studies. It's frequently going to be electrophysiology that I will talk about later today. But though there is a starting point. And remember that, that the very first starting point is usually experimentally. And then you get to the point where you feel that you kind of understand your receptor. And this might be based on, say, doing mutations or something. If you're really lucky, you have, you're a large, rich pharmaceutical company, and you have a structural biology division, what would they do for you? So if you're, if you're at a very large company, and this company has a structural biology division, what would one of the first things to do? Again, you're still ahead of me. you would try to get a structure of the target. And that will likely fail. Uh, Isn't it like too much work to, 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 to get the structure of the membrane or something? Like, if this is successful, it might be $150 billion of revenue. There is no such thing as too much work. <laughs> uh, no, but seriously, there, there are companies that have invested $2 billion in structures of G-protein coupled receptors and failed. They didn't get anything. And that's, hey, that's a risk you take in the market, right? That's not every investment pays off. Um, so if you can't get a structure of it, what would you typically do then? Uh, 
because that's when they start looking at you. No, but we did. We failed. We didn't get a structure. No, because that's that's what's happened in ninety nine percent of the cases. No, well, but that we'd already done that a tiny bit, right? So that there is something else. A bit, but something related to the topology that you've done in other courses. Yes, you would try to create a homology model of it, right? Um, and it. Think about that too, that the further you get in this program, the more you should think in terms of integration, that by, by necessity, when we bring things up in courses, we'd have to have hey, one course on bioinformatics, one course on modeling, one course on biophysics, one course on genomics. But in practice, when you're working, you should, of course, use all this knowledge in one case. So the point is, you would obviously do an homology model. And if you now have this homology model, in best case, you're going to have some rough idea roughly where the binding site is. And you can start doing all these experimental studies that you talked about that, well, if you change residue loose in 49, that appears to influence the binding. So you have a rough idea roughly where the binding site is and roughly what you would like to do with the protein, say inhibit it or uh, potentiate it. So, and that's really when you enter the actual drug discovery process. The only reason for bringing this up is that both at your job and possibly at an exam, you would never ever get the question, what type of free energy parameters should I use? because that's why they're looking at you. That's why you're around the table. You're going to have somebody saying that I have a structure and I have no idea how to find something to bind to it. So don't, and this is important, don't jump too far ahead and assume that it's a matter of what free energy calculation you want to do. Stay at the planning stage for a while and think hard about it. How can I really approach this? And it's very easy to end up in the situation that when you got the world's largest hammer, suddenly everything around you starts to look like nails. And that's frequently a very bad idea. But okay, we have a potential binding site. And now, at this point, the experimentalists have pretty much given up uh, and sent the, the computational chemistry team will have to look at this. What would you do? Take a look at what could bind to it. And how could you find that? You're assuming that you'd already know that ligand. Yeah, well, there, there might be one natural ligand, but that's not. If it's a pain receptor, you probably know the natural ligand that causes this to create pain, right? But if you want to develop a drug, you'd better find something new that binds to it. Yeah. So then, I guess you're looking computationally at this like, compound screen that we talked about, which mm -hmm. would be so useful here, right, to make something new. Well, that depends. Uh, I was at a fun meeting in uh, Thursday, Friday, when I couldn't be here with you. Uh, I was at a fun meeting in an EU project in uh, Amsterdam. Well, it wasn't that fun to travel, but... I had some great uh, discussion with Mark Forster at Syngenta. Uh, well, Syngenta is this company that specializes in uh, any, any type of pesticides or insecticides, and they do a lot of things related to crop. And there are now apparently new types of screens. The problem is that typically you have one of two types of screens. Either you have a database with compounds called, uh, one called zinc in particular, that contains a bunch of compounds. I don't know how many, but about probably a couple of million or so, that you can order off the shelf. They're super cheap, $10. So why, the, but then you could argue if that if those are already known, haven't they been tested? Do you think they have? Well, but let's start at the compounds. In general, they haven't been. How many receptors are there? Well, if we forget about the membrane proteins for a second, there are 20,000 genes in your body. And if there are now 100 million compounds or something, that it's an ast well, this is a tiny amount of chemistry space, but it's still an astronomically large testing space. One thing I did not mention last week, I think, but it's called something called repurposing. Have you heard of that? So repurposing is the idea that rather than going out for something new, uh, go vintage and secondhand. Find a compound that is already used as a drug for something and see if this drug can be used for anything else. Now, this might sound really stupid, but it turns out many of these drugs are small hydrophobic. They bind in lots of places. So what's the advantage of using a drug that's already known? Cheaper. Why would it be cheaper? I guess you already know a lot about it. Like you, know the, you probably know something about how it looks like or where it binds and what it can do for the human. Mm -hmm. Something more important. There was a very important concept that I brought up at one or two slides last week. It's already tested for side effects. Admetox, right. Yeah. 
You know that's how to administrate it. You know that it doesn't cause any bad side effects. It's not too toxic. It's not going to kill 20% of the people taking it. And that's where 90% of drugs fail. If you're repurposing, you already know that that's fine. But assume that you couldn't, you might have found some small hits or something in this database. What Mark Forster told me about, the other alternative is, of course, to go all the way and synthesize completely new chemicals, astronomically expensive. So there is apparently new companies in the US, and I haven't had time to look this up yet, but they have a library of, what is it? I think it's roughly 25,000 small chemical compound parts. And that's not a whole lot, or might be 50,000. But the whole point is that then they can join these parts together as pairs, any pair with any other pair. And suddenly, 50,000 squared, that's a fairly large number. This costs you roughly 30 to $50 to order a compound, and it takes you four weeks. And suddenly, that this space is, uh, and uh, again, if this eventually, when you run out, I bet you could find ways to join three parts together. So the whole point, they have these parts expressed. And then they, rather than finding an arbitrary organic chemist to synthesize a completely arbitrary compound, you now just need to synthesize one reaction to bind these parts together. So that is very much a question of chemistry space. And then you start with screening this, and you find something that's reasonably good. How, we, how would you find something that's reasonably good in the screening? What methods would you use? Well, one way of doing it is doing experimental high throughput screening, right? That's not really what this course is about. And it's, you can do it. It's very expensive. Um, but if you don't do it experimentally, what's the other alternative? Docking, yes. If there is one thing you should remember with docking is that it's fast but sloppy. And that might sound bad, but it's not. Because the whole, when we talk, think about the sizes of these chemistry spaces, right? Your success is going to be proportional to how many compounds you screen, not how accurate you do it. Yes, you might miss something that's awesome. That's fine if you find something that's great. And that's why docking has really been optimized to be fast, 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 fast. And if there's anything people have done is to try to go to larger and larger compound libraries, not to do the docking more accurate. That's a much later step. So the drawback with this is that most of the things you find in docking are going to be false hits. It can be very frustrating that you find 1,000 hits, and then you go into the lab. And if you're lucky, you might have one or two that show something. The 998 compounds of 1,000 failed. Is that bad? Why not? So this is awesome. You have two leads, right? Or two hits. There's something you can work on. Yeah, it's insanely cheap. You can run it on a laptop overnight. Now, the challenge here, I would, I don't know, but I would guess that as we're moving more and more into this modern world of big data, machine learning, and everything, I would assume that we're going to see Google is very interested in this. For instance, I know that they're hiring tons of people from the pharmaceutical industry now with docking background. Can you use other information? Can you use information, anything related to admin talks for the literature or something? Can you find ways to bring more information into this step? I would guess that although docking is very low intensity, now wait 10 years, and I think they're going to find ways to use insane amounts of computational power for it and in particular the same amounts of data. So there you stand and you have your compound. Why is this usually pretty much useless? And not just about winding. What is usually the case with this binding? Well, yes. Yeah, so, that, so normally, how would you measure binding? And there are kind of three answers here, and they're all right from different points of view. Oh, did, oh sorry. Now, now you're thinking about how. Um, I, I'm more thinking in terms of units. Um, Sorry, uh, there, there, are, there are lots of ways to measure where the two compounds are bound together experimentally. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll skip that for now, but fluorescence would certainly be one of them. Um, but you, yeah, well, well, you know that when, when I say binding, why do two molecules bind? 
Right, so what is the unit of binding? What does that have to be? Yes, energy, right? Uh, kilojoules or kcals per mole. That's how maybe a computational chemist would measure it. How would a physicist measure it? Uh, they would probably do KT. Uh, so it's essentially the same thing. Physicists love using KT for everything. Um, but there is another way to measure it if you're a wet lab chemist. Can you just read out the concentrations of the... Yes. So, so when you have, the, when you have the, chem the equilibrium between bound and unbound states, right? When you calculate the binding, co uh, the binding constant of this reaction, then the concentration at which 50% of the molecules are bound, that's a concentration. So the lower this concentration is, the higher, the stronger the binding is. So a really good compound a finished drug, that would be at least nonomolar, if not a picomolar affinity. So in, say, you need insanely low concentration for it to bind. At the hit state, what concentrations are you talking about? Maybe millimolar. Um, so it's very bad at binding. This is, you would have to administer way too much compound. And the more compound you administer, the more side effects you're going to have. So that it's pretty much useless for a drug at this stage. So on the one hand, you're happy. But the problem is you're going to need to improve this. You need to get it better and better. The way you do this is that now you're gradually moving to fewer and fewer and fewer compounds. And then you're going to use more and more advanced methods, some of the ones that I'm going to talk about today, to try to optimize, calculate exactly what the binding is try to come up with a way to modify the molecule, say add an ethyl or methyl group, see if does this improve binding or not. And you can do this either with docking or free energy methods I will sp speak about today. And then you come back next week, well, four weeks later, which is this usual iteration time in Big Pharma. And you tell the experimental team, well, you know, based on the results you showed us four weeks ago, here's a new list of compounds that we think that you should now synthesize and try. We think these are going to be better. Does this usually work? It often does. Uh, I forgot this, but I can actually try to dig up a paper for you. There is a particular group uh, led by Bill Jorgensen at uh, Yale. And they're awesome the way they use free energy calculations. And they've read, there are those whole bunch of publications where they show that how they start with a millimolar compound. And then like eight weeks later and a couple of experimental iterations later, they're down to picomolar binders. And there's very, very subtle changes. Remember this optimization step I showed for the HI1 protease inhibitor? That's really keep adding things and moving. And this is where you frequently use all this information about pharmacophores and everything. Would it be good to have a, in principle, divine inspiration is fine, right? But the smarter you are, the more you look at the structure, you spend a lot of time sitting and just looking at molecular models that it would be good to have a hydrophobic ring here, or it would be good to have a hydrogen bond uh, donor here. So that's, it's 50% black magic, 50% chemistry, and then another 10% luck or so. So now you have an OS, and th this is what you call lead optimization. Um, and usually you would end up with an entire series or something because, well, you don't, at this stage, you don't really know which compound of the series is going to be best. But ideally, you can now deliver a series of 10 very promising compounds to your experimentalists. And somewhere here, the computational part of the project gradually winds down. But what would happen later? Well, both in the computer, but in, in, gener in general, in the drug design, what, what would happen in big pharma? So at this stage, you're still in the preclinical phase. Um, so, but eventually what you do, you would go into the lab, you would do more and more experimental tests. You would start doing some tests maybe on, well, first the chemistry and then eventually in single cells and then eventually on animals. Um, and once you're done with animals and you have filed a huge amount of paperwork, then you might get permission to move to what we call phase one trials. And that would be to test it in healthy subjects. So what's the point of a phase one trial? Sorry? Yes, but what do you mean by it can be applied? There's one specific thing you're testing in phase one. Test exactly. You test that they don't die. Which, of course, you're not always right. Occasionally they do die. Um, or get very bad side effects. So the point is, this has, this has nothing to do with how efficient the drug is. It's just to show that it doesn't kill people. And if you're lucky, and it doesn't kill people, after phase one, 
well, I'm not going to ask you what happens after phase one because that's phase two. So what's the point of phase two? Right, so it's basically to show that it works. Uh, the difference is that once you move from phase one to phase two, you're going to need a much, much, much wider uh, range of test subjects. This is something that's frequently criticized because, uh, that, so what do we typically test on? Well, not in, that would be preclinically, but what do you typically test on in particular in phase one and phase two? Hmm? Why? Actually, they're not always white anymore. So the reason why they're healthy and men, there are two reasons for this. So, for, so first, one problem is, of course, if you're ill, we have no idea how the drug might start to interplay with that illness, right? And even if it might also be the f worse that this illness might disguise some other things that you don't see that in a healthy, if you already have high blood pressure, we might not see that this drug would create high blood pressure. So that you prefer, it's very important that people are healthy so you can see all deviations. But this is something that also comes up that it's so unfair. Why do we do most clinical trials on men? They have less uh, hormonal changes. No, something much simpler. Men don't get pregnant. Uh, because you don't want to kill kids. And so that, again, mm -hmm. pregnancy is one of the most sensitive things in biology. It's extremely complicated. Suddenly you have two individuals, and these chemicals will cross the bloodstream to the fetus. So that it's not, it's not just big pharma not caring about women. It's because there are some things that are very, very difficult to control. But that, that happens, that comes much later, right? But in the early phases, because in the early phases, this is where all the mistakes happen. As you move eventually and stay, and what, what actually can happen, you can even get a drug that goes to the market after step, uh, stage three. And stage three, since we're talking about say, what would be what? Yes, so it's stage three, so that it has to be better. And it actually, in principle, it is a requirement that to get, put a new drug on the market, it has to be better than existing alternatives. And then it depends a little bit on how much, much lawyer, how many lawyers the pharmaceutical company has, and if they can, I bet they can always argue that there's one particular case that is better. But frequently, if an FDA, for instance, rejects a drug, it's because that the company hasn't shown that this is significantly better than the alternatives. And what frequently happens then is that if you're lucky and the drug uh, gets uh, permission so you can put it on the market, initially it can only be prescribed to men. That's quite frequent. And then eventually you expand this more and more as you've done more and more testing so that it can cover well, more individuals, more different types of diseases, having a disease in combination with something else. Um, sadly, sometimes it's in the pharmaceutical industry's best interest in not pushing this too much. Um, omeoprazole, Losec, this blockbuster from AstraZeneca, uh, that uh, it's a proton pump inhibitor. And this is how it can actually uh, treat acid reflux. There was something very important that got people the Nobel Prize when related to acid reflux and ulcers. Nope. <laughs> there were two Australians that got the Nobel Prize for serving something. So acid, uh, well, ulcers in general, for a very long time, that was a disease believed to be caused by stress or something or drinking too much coffee, in which case I would have it. And it was also a frequently lifelong disease. You couldn't really do anything about it. Uh, exactly. So that is showed by, uh, caused by Helicobacter pylori, which means that you can treat it with what? Yeah. Antibiotics. <laughs> Which was both good and bad because prior to this, if you're a pharmaceutical company, uh, the best possible drug you can imagine is what? Lifestyle drug. There is no coincidence that Lipeter is so popular because the drug you take against high cholesterol. The patients will continue to, continue to take it for 30 years and you just rake in the profits. The worst possible drug is a cheap drug that the patient takes for five to ten days and then the patient is cured and no longer needs your drug. So omeoprazole was of course great, right? That this is a western disease, acid reflux and everything. People have it a lot. And of course the acid reflux part is suddenly, uh, that's certainly something that you, uh, that most of us can have at a point or two in life. But it's usually not an ulcer. Uh, 
But that these really chronic parts, that's awesome because you would sell the drugs to people for 40 years. So what happened? Well, and the, but, that's, that's more, but that's more related to the antibiotics. That's not related to Losec. So, but eventually, it actually took them 10 years before they, and this was partly because the discoveries happened in parallel. It was at least 10 years after the day discovery in putting Losec on the market until they actually proved and certified it for use together with antibiotics to actually cure. Which, of course, for the company, it's bad. But I think they, will, they survived because by that, they had already had most of the profits and the patents were about to expire. So this is what's so complicated, and this is partly the, the way I tell it. This can be interpreted as I'm saying that they deliberately withheld it. It's not that easy. Because this is like an airplane. You can't just take a drug and say, this, I, I tested this on 10 people. It seems to work with antibiotics. It requires a huge amount of testing um, to get it approved. That's in brief roughly how drug design works. Um, but there was one thing I cheated. I didn't tell you about how this actual lead optimization usually happens. And Black magic, trial and error, has certainly been one of the things. But what's increasingly happening today is that you're basing this with more or less accurate free energy calculations. You also had a lab on free energy calculations on Thursday, right? So I'm gonna, today I'm going to spend some time talking about free energy calculations, a little bit how you would do it in practice in computer simulations. I'm not going to go through things that are too specific to Gromax, but I'm going to try to bring this up in a concept of how we can use it to optimize things. So why hasn't this been used instead of docking? You did it on the lab, right? How long did it take you to do that lab? Yes, and the simulations were probably tens of minutes at least for a completely trivial system. If you have systems with hundreds of thousands of atoms, these simulations will take days. And compare that to how quick a docking calculation is. A second or something. So that historically this has been way too costly, but in principle this has the physics correct. So the idea of free energy is really that free energy determines the relative population of states. Uh, if you know the difference in free energy between two states, this is just the Boltzmann distribution that tells you how probable one is relative to the other. And that, of course, determines where that determines whether, whether a molecule is bound. Uh, it determines what direction a reaction will go to. It will determine if you can get the free energy of opening an ion channel, you can determine whether this will be open or closed. So if you know that there is a difference in 5 kilojoule between the open and closed states of an ion channel, and if you now stabilize, let's say that the, open, the closed state is by default 5 kilojoules per mole more stable, but if you find some compound that stabilizes the open state by 6 kilojoules per mole, you're going to now have the open state to be better. So the reason you want to go after free energies is that if you could calculate these things really quickly in a computer, we can instantly say that that really complicated molecule, adding, say, an ethyl group here and a hydrogen bond donor here, would have a better delta G, that is, it would bind stronger if you receptor. Why would you do that? Why wouldn't, if, if it takes a couple of weeks and docking is so fast, why would you want to calculate free energies? Yes, but we know it's right if we could measure it in the lab. So first, why can't do we do it with docking? I guess you, well, you could, but it just takes longer. Well, in, in general, the problem, right, is docking is fast but sloppy. Mm -hmm. So the probability, if you have one molecule and you want to check, does this get better if I add an ethyl group? Docking might or might not get that right. The errors are too large in docking. And if it's just one ethyl group or something, then it's fine. But if you now want to test 1,000 random ways of modifying your molecule, the problem is at this stage, you can't really afford to make 99% errors anymore. You can if you're starting from a billion molecules. But if you only have a sample of 1,000 modifications, you need better than 1% hit rate. So why can't you do it in the lab? Well, I said it was $10. You're right, of course, but why is it, why is it not $10? No, so it depends what type of molecules you are, right? If you are testing molecules that are, have already been synthesized, that have been ordered, then it's cheap. 
What can happen is that they say, sorry, molecule 14 that you wanted, we're out of stock on that and we don't expect to produce it right now. Sorry. At the docking stage, you would likely accept not to include that molecule. Because if, if they do exist, you can get them for $10. If you want something that does not exist, molecule 14 with a methyl group added, say, then it can be $50,000 to synthesize it. So you, $10 times 10,000, that's fine. Or 100, uh, times 100,000 is still fine. $50,000 times 100,000 is not fine. It would also take too long because in many cases it, would be a, it could be a matter of months to synthesize an arbitrary molecule. But so the neat thing with free energy, if you could get at least 75% hit rate or something about all these model modifications you test, then we might be able to just let's synthesize 10 molecules. We can't do that if, we, if, we, if I start from 1,000 and if I just synthesize 10. I can't accept a 1% proportion of being right, right? But if I'm 75% right, I would expect to have seven or so of those molecules be good. So the reason for getting free energies is that docking is not accurate enough. The lab stuff is too expensive. And then, of course, in some cases, you want to do this just to understand what happens. But that's, in, the, in a drug design point of view, is because docking is fast but sloppy. Experiments are slow and expensive. So ideally, we would like to calculate these free energies from simulations, just as you did in the lab. And in principle, we can do this. Molecular simulations and statistical mechanics. We spent quite a few lectures going through this. There is one caveat here, though. Um, if we forget about all the equations for a second, you could, of course, just run a simulation and see whether your molecule is by. What's the problem with that? That's point one, right? If a molecule binds once, it says hardly anything. You might have been lucky or unlucky, depending on who you were after. If you see 10 times, you start to get things better. The only problem is if you have a really large, complicated receptor that has to open or close, it could take a microsecond just to see one binding event. And now we're talking about 10, 10 microseconds simulated, 10 or, well, 10 to hundreds of microseconds of simulation. This gets insanely expensive. Um, but assuming that we could solve that part and really get an accurate free energy calculation, if we get that, we can quantitatively predict exactly what would happen in macroscopic experiments. Do you see the difference? Most of the other things we've been looking at in simulations has to do with measuring an enthalpy or a diffusion coefficients. Those have very direct properties, something that you can calculate more or less directly from your simulation. The beautiful thing with free energies is that free energies correspond I would, I would argue that almost anything you can measure in the lab can be translated to a free energy. And of course, so the reason for calculating free energies is to go in the other direction. If I can calculate free energies, I can predict experimental outcomes. And by now, you should know this equation. Uh, we have Gibbs and Helmholtz free energies. So the Gibbs free energy would be the enthalpy minus temperature times the entropy. And this enthalpy corresponds to the potential energy and then this volume thing. So this was an old slide that I reused and I, I actually didn't do a typo here. Um, there was also this other free energy. And here, do you see what letter I use for the other free energy here? So the reason for not changing this is that this is quite common among physicists. Uh, so standards are a good thing. That means that everybody should develop their own, right? Uh, Sadly, there are no good standards. If you see delta G, that's virtually always Gibbs free energy. Occasionally, you just see a delta F. A delta F can be anything, F for free. If you see a delta A, it's usually Helmholtz in physics. So what was the difference? What is the, what's the difference between Gibbs and Helmholtz? It's a bit of repetition from earlier on in the course. Yeah. So Helmholtz assumes that we do this under constant number of particles constant volume and constant temperature, while Gibbs would be NPT, constant number of particles, constant pressure, and constant temperature. And normally in the lab, you can forget about the volume term, uh, but you should feel a little bit bad about it. I always do. So, you know, the point here is that I want to get you to understanding free energies for proteins, but if the problem with starting to look at something binding is that there are going to be too many steps in it at once. So let's start with something much, much, much simpler. 
one of the simplest processes we can imagine is that if you take a small compound, say cyclohexane, and I want to calculate what is the cost of having this in gas phase, or if it's a liquid, you might have pure cyclohexane, and moving this to a solvent, say water. That is what we had in pretty much chapter one and two of the book, the simplest possible solvation energy. The only reason why people, well, it's going to turn out that there is a reason why people are obsessed with this, but it's a very simple reaction and one we can study without involving large protein chains and everything. Why do people frequently use cyclohexane, by the way? You've probably seen that, Molly. Do you know what cyclohexane looks like? You can probably guess. It's a cyclic compound, yes. So what's the difference between cyclohexane and how many carbons do you think are in it? Six. six. But you know a cyclic compound with six carbons. What's, which, what's that one called? Benzene. benzene. So benzene is C6 and then how many carbons? C686, and that's what you call an aromatic compound. It's completely flat. But in many cases, we don't. Aromatic compounds are a bit complicated and everything. They tend to interact in strange ways. So cyclohexane is the equivalent aliphatic compound. So that's, that has a ring that's going to look either like a small boat or as a small chair. But it's, a ring, it's just six CH2 groups, so six ethyl groups. So it's a very simple compound. There are only two types of atoms, the carbon and the hydrogens, and all of them are, there is nothing like aromatics or something. So that's why it's very common as a solvent. It's kind of the simplest organic solvent you can imagine, and it's not too, point, too toxic. Uh, so in principle, we might want to study how expensive it is to insert something in water or a membrane or whatever. So this solvent here, I've drawn it as water, but in principle, this could be anything. This is also important for protein folding. Why? We talked about that a lot in the course, but not from a concept of free energy, perhaps. Well, no, I think we did. Uh, right. So this is the free energy of solvation. If it's good to solvate something, that is going to love to be on the surface of a protein. If it's expensive to solvate it, it's going to be buried on the inside. So that's why it's related. And that's why, actually, when we brought this up in the book, it was because this was important to understand protein folding. And here we're rather bringing it up. Now we're going to think more about how we actually calculate these properties. So just as we told, called it partition-free energy, when the book described it, you can think of the partition, how, much, how buried or exposed the side chain is, or whether a particular side chain likes to be in the water or a membrane, if it's going to be a membrane protein. And this looks fairly simple, right? The only problem is that these partition-free engines can be pretty complicated. I actually had a student who worked on this a couple of years ago. I'll get some slides on that later. So here you can have multiple different charged or uncharged side chains and see how they behave. In some cases, these side chains will even turn the helix a bit. So this is research done less than 10 years ago, understanding how individual charged or polar amino acids behave in membranes. So it, it can get pretty complicated, but in principle, we just the helical backbone here is pretty much neutral. It's plus minus zero when it comes to inserting it. So the cost of inserting a helix in a membrane is going to depend entirely on these 20 side chains. So we can calculate the cost of those 20 side chains so we will understand how expensive it is to turn something into a membrane protein. So that's still a partition, but a slightly more complicated partition. So how do you, would you get free energy? You did this a bit in the lab. But my point isn't so much, don't think, well, don't think too much in the lab. So if you run a simulation and you see the tendency of being in this way, you mm, you're, you're quite right, but you're jumping a bit too far forward. Uh, let's keep it more simple. What is a free energy? Entropy and entropy. You're too advanced. What is a free energy? What is a free energy? So why is it called free energy? Because the energy is able to work. Work. So the cost of moving from one state to another with different free energies, that corresponds to the amount of work you have to do on the system. 
Now, that work might be negative. What would negative work mean? Well, negative work me would mean that if positive is that you do work on the system, negative would mean that the system does work on you. Uh, but that you would either pay or gain energy from changing the system. And in principle, we could measure that. If you want to take, what is the free energy of taking water from, say, 20 degrees to 80 degrees? If you have water, or like it's my but what is the specific heat of water? The specific heat of water is the amount of free energy required to increase the temperature of water, a kilo of water, by one degree centigrade. It's 4.184. Four, is it approximately 4.2? How many more decimals do you know? I remember, uh, we just, I remember now. No, that's a trick question. How many more decimals are there? There are no more decimals. Why are there no more decimals? is the definition. So how many kcals is that? I bet you do remember it. The round number is one kcal. That's funny. Why is it one kcal? That's how you have defined kcal. 1 kcal is how much it takes to increase the temperature of 1 kilo of water by 1 degree. Um, but then, of course, in the SI system and everything, we have gone back and defined that to be exactly 4.184 kilojoules per mole. So a joule has to do with the uh, 1 watt during 1 second. But the point is that this, we've defined this. It's exactly 4.184 between them. So this has to do, so in principle, if, if I can just measure how much work I need to do to change the state of a system, I can calculate the free energy. And I would argue that conceptually this is the easiest way. How would you do this with the water? You go down to one of these store, hardware stores and you buy a watt meter for roughly $15 plug that into the wall, and then you measure how much energy you need to do to heat the water when you're boiling it. Now, there, that will likely not be a very good result because you're going to have all these losses in the uh, stuff and everything. You can do it more accurate in the lab, but in principle, you just measure how much energy do I need. And that's the work, right? The electrical work. How much energy do I, did I need to use to increase the temperature of the water by one degree centigrade? Uh, you could do this for something really complicated too. If I have a small protein here and a ligand, or it can be any two molecules that are bound together, I can calculate how strong this binding is by slowly pulling them apart. Slowly, slowly, slowly. And measure, I can add a small spring here, right? And if I now start to move this string, well, I know how much force I'm applying because, well, uh, I, I can, well if, I, if I move this by, with a constant rate, the force will be determined by how much the spring, the force constant in the spring has been extended. So I can integrate, I know exactly what the force here is as a function of time. How is force related to work? So I take the force multiplied, the force is newtons. And what is, it's a newton meter, right? So I take my force and multiply that by the length I'm pulling it, or I integrate it actually. So if I know the force as a function of the position here, I can calculate how much energy I'm changing. Will that work? Well, by definition, it will work. It's physics. There is only one problem. I have to be, I have to pull, actually, I would have to pull infinitely slow so that the system is always at equilibrium. What would happen otherwise? So assuming that it's Friday evening and you're in the bar and you want to get to the counter and order a glass of wine. Tons of people on the dance floor. How do you get to the bar? Uh, 
you're going to need to move slowly, right? And try to squeeze your way between people. What happens if you just run to the bar? So that you're going you're gonna to bump into everything, right? So that if you do this very quick, you're going to get a beautiful energy here. It's even going to be a free energy. But the free energy you will get is, what is the free energy of heating my system a lot because you're causing lots of friction? You will get a free energy. It's not just the free energy you thought you would get. Because the free energy we would get, if I do this so slow enough that you don't cause any friction or anything, because friction will lead to heat, right? Uh, so I need to do this so slowly, and the equivalent of moving very gently between all these people in the bar so that you're not upsetting the system at all. And in principle, this has to be infinity. Now, infinity is a very long time. Uh, so in practice, you try to make do with microsecond or 100 nanoseconds. So why would you do, why is a microsecond enough? No, it's not enough. Uh, but what you always do in simulation, what people do, and this is equally true in the lab, of course, if the longest simulation you hope to be able to run is a microsecond, you run a microsecond and you hope that is enough. That is a very, very, very bad justification for it, but hey, guilty as charged, that's what we do, right? It would be better if you could do it 100 times longer. I will show you that there are some tricks to get away with, but it's very common that people just try it. Is there something else you could do? No, because if you measure heat, you're just measuring friction, right? Um, I, I was rather thinking, rather than just pulling ahead and directly simulating one microsecond, and this has become so much easier today because computers are faster, sit down with a paper and pen. Do a back of the envelope calculation. Is this realistic? Do you hope to be able to see this free energy? You would be surprised in how many cases the answer to that is no. There is no theoretical way you could do this with the type of simulation you're doing. And people, nevertheless, they spend six months or half a student's career trying to do it. So before, think before you simulate. Uh, is it even really? So th but in theory, if this worked, and if this was a very simple protein, uh, you could be, if this was a small molecule and the, both the molecule was relatively rigid and the protein is relatively rigid so we don't disturb them too much, then this could work and then you could in principle see that you would have a very high force that would mean that it's a strong binder and if the force was lower you would have a weaker binder. So you could see the difference and we could translate that to a free energy. The cool thing is that this is something you do in the lab but you don't think of it as free energy binding. Have you heard about AFM or atomic force microscopy? It's a really cool technique. Um, an atomic force microscope relies on all the forces you have between atoms. And you have seen those in the lab. W what are those forces? Leonard Jones, right? Very weak or van der Waals interaction at least. So all atoms will interact with each other. So what you do is that you create a very, very fine tip here, and it's so fine so that at the tip here you should just have a couple of atoms of width. But that's possible to do. Um, and then when you sweep this very, very, very close to a sample here, there will be small forces between that tip and the atoms. But these are of course going to be so small that you won't see anything at all happening. But then this is connected to a small cantilever, so it's basically the whole point, this hole or it can move up here, right? So that it can rotate around this part. And then you just have a small mirror here and then you shine this with a laser. And when you have tiny, tiny, tiny differences here, you can detect how the laser beam is being deflected up here. This is a super cheap experimental setup compared to most other things. Uh, you, people, you can almost design it in the lab yourself if you're a graduate student. And then you can actually directly trace patterns of individual atoms. Usually not something you do. You don't, you don't do this to determine the shape of a protein or something, but if you want to see what this, what's on the surface, so you can. And what you in particular can do is that if you can somehow take this AFM tip and attach it to a linker or something, then you can measure, because this motion here is directly correlated to how much force there is between the tip and your sample, right? So if you take a protein, you can use an AFM tip to literally pull part of the protein. Really cool. People have done this to, for instance, measure the free energy of unfolding of beta sheets and everything. So this is something that actually works. Uh, 
but you can imagine that the motions here are going to be tiny, right? You're talking about like micro nanometers that they move in a second or so. But it works. So let's then try to mimic this in a computer experiment. So this is a uh, small dinitrophilin hapton. It doesn't matter what it is. This is a small compound bound to a very large protein. And can you try to connect the virtual spring here? So this spring corresponds roughly to Yulena Jones interaction. We can measure how much energy it will take to pull this out. And then you start pulling here with some constant velocity. So if you, in a typical simulation, that might be one nanosecond, just to make the, uh, the units easier. If in one nanosecond you want this to move away, or let's, you know what, let's give it, let's call it five nanoseconds. If in one, five nanoseconds you would like this to move out, say five nanometers away, what is the speed with which you're pulling? Yes, or in more conventional units, that would be five meters per second. <laughs> Sorry? It's insanely fast, right? And the problem is what looks very slow in your simulation, if you're comparing that setup to that one, five meters per second, it's insane. And this is the problem. So what will you primarily create during your five meter per second pulling? Heat, heat, heat. So the problem is you're gonna need to pull way slower. So this means this will require very long and careful simulations. But people could do this even 15 years ago. So here's the force measured in piconewtons, measured as a function of the position of this cantilever. And I think they go up to roughly 450 piconewtons, which is fairly typical. And then they claim that this is the unbinding force they get, which is quite true. This is the unbinding force they get for that particular experiment. But then you can plot this as a function of the speed. So and the funny thing is that the slower, well, funny, this is kind of obvious to you, right? The slower I pull, so here you're at roughly 10 meters per second. And then the force of unbinding would be roughly 1,000. But the slower you pull, the lower this force gets because you're creating less and less and less and less heat. And this is what you frequently can do. You can create a model for how this would work, and then you can extrapolate this so that if you start to see a pattern here, and in this case, this is not a random pattern, but I won't have time to go into explanation of this particular shape of the curve. But the point here is that if you can pull slower and slower, so let's, start, let's say you start with a one nanosecond simulation, then a 10 nanosecond simulation, a 100 nanosecond simulation, a one microsecond simulation, if you're lucky, you can start to extrapolate. Because if you now start to see that these, all your values, they're starting to fall along a curve that would go to a constant value for very long times, even though you haven't really reached that value yet, you can extrapolate and say that based on my fitting of my curve, I expect the value to be, in their case, I think it was 60 piconewton at very large times. So I'm not gonna, so I, well, 15 years ago, this was a very nice experiment that you could do better. But the point is that even if, the, even if you can't really simulate slow enough to get this to correspond to the experiment, the experiment would be like 10 to the minus 6, 1 micrometer per second. You can't get to that in a simulation, but we can extrapolate it and get a value that's reasonably close. So why don't you do this? It's awesome, right? We could do this for all our compounds. It's worse. Each and, every one, each and every black dot here has to be, there's a standard bar there. So each and every black dot has to be at least three different calculations. And some of these are really slow. So you're probably talking about 100 calculate simulations here. This would take, uh, this is an entire scientific paper just for one compound. And they get 60 plus minus 30. So it's, the error is astronomically large. So this particular case was interesting because the protein, the reason they did this is not because they were stupid. They're very close friends of mine who are smart scientists. In this particular case, they actually wanted to understand what happens to the protein when you unfold it. The problem is that it works in theory. It's not gonna work to replace docking because it's way too slow. So the question is, is there some other smarter way you can get to obtain a, oops, sorry. What did I do there? To obtain the free energies. And we're going to need to go back a little bit to think about what we really mean by a free energy again. 
A free energy is always a difference between two states. What does that mean? Well, I get back to um, This is a small pro I think I used this protein before, FK5, FKBP, which just that's for FK501 binding protein. Poor protein doesn't even have a real name. This is one state when you have the protein with this compound FK501 bound. And we want to compare the free energy of this state with the state where you have the protein without anything and the FK501 molecule in water. There's two clear states, state A and state B, and I want to compare those. What is that characterizes a free energy? What can we say about a free energy? How does it depend on the way between, on the path between these two states? It does not depend on it, then why doesn't it depend on it? Mm -hmm. But why? Why is that true? Can you prove it? Mm -hmm. But why does that mean what would happen otherwise? Right. That it's a very simple proof. Uh, what you call in mathematics, you would call this reduc reductio ad absurdum. That you assume the opposite, and if we show that the opposite leads to something absurd, then the statement must be true, right? And the obvious way of showing this was that assuming that there are two paths, one with one where I, well, one, well, sorry, one where the free energy difference is higher than in the other. And if I constantly, I use energy to move the system along the cheap pathway, and then I let the system move itself back the other way, then I'm back where I started, but I just gained energy. And that would violate conservation of energy. It would be a perpetuum mobile of the first kind. But this leads to something else that's important. What paths are you allowed to take between state A and state B when you calculate it? No. That would be the path nature takes. What path are you allowed to take? If you just want to calculate this, you can take absolutely any path you want. And this is something that comes back. Um, it turns out that some things are very easy to measure in the lab, but hard to calculate. Other things are hard or impossible to get in the lab, but they're much easier to calculate. So when it comes to calculating a free energy, which path should I choose? The easiest. Sorry? The easiest. But the easiest for what? The the, no, the one that's easiest to simulate. simulate. Because if you do it in the lab, you're obviously going to get the one that's the, the best one in nature, right? If you're going to do this in the computer, sorry, there are no brownie points for having a path that corresponds as closely as possible to the lab. And that's essentially what you're getting if you're trying to slowly pull it. But the free energy only depends on the final and starting states. So let's p see, can we find paths that are unphysical, but they're smarter? As long as the beginning state and the end state are physical and corresponds to my state, if I can determine a free energy between them, I'm good. And that leads us to something slightly more. This looks complicated, but it's not. Or wait, it might be, but it's not that complicated. Um, rather than taking a small compound and trying to pull that away from a protein, what if we start with four states here? There are, there are, if you, in, in general, you can think about four things. So if this, the yellow, tri, the yellow uh, square here, that would be my a diamond. That would be my ligand. And here, in this state, I have the ligand in water. I don't care. There's no protein here. Up here, I have my ligand bound to my protein. I can also take my protein, but really without the ligand. So the red thing here, the red hexagon here means that I kind of, I've removed the ligand. Well, the, the, core, the, the atoms might be there, but I've removed the ligand so it does not interact with anything. So that's, think of that as a, that's really the, the system without the ligand. The ligand doesn't exist there. But had it been, it would have been in that position. Or you can think a pure water box where you don't have the ligand either. And for all these things, you can imagine how expensive it is to move between these two states, right? So the, the part A here would mean to bringing my ligand close to the protein. That's an extremely difficult thing to calculate. Um, 
because then we would be pulling in everything. So the point, I want to avoid doing that. Um, I'm sorry, I should have rotated this a bit because I realized now that these four states don't correspond to each other. That should be transposed. So one, point, one possible state here is that I have my protein and the ligand is bound to my protein. Another thing is that if I take my ligand and I just gradually disappear all the atoms. I know this is horrible. This is alchemy, right? You can't do that in chemistry. But you can do it. You have charges and you have Leonard Jones parameters. So let's just gradually tune down all these parameters to zero. When they are all zero, there are no interactions left. It's a valid calculation. While we're doing it, you're violating everything you can imagine in physics. But once you've done it, you just have your protein without the ligand. That is a well-defined state. That is a well-defined state. If I can just calculate the free energy between these two states, that free energy will be a valid description of the change between these two states. I can also take just the ligand in water. That's also a well-defined state. And this is, of course, delta G binding, right? How much does it cost to take the ligand and move it into the protein? But that was very expensive to calculate. I can also have take the ligand in water, but I gradually disappear this ligand. I tune down the parameters, scale down the parameters the same way I did when it was in the protein. Well, a dummy in water, that would mean just having water, right? But if we start with a protein ligand, and then I move along these four arrows so that eventually I'm back with the protein ligand, what is the sum of all these changes if I move one lap here? Zero. Zero. Why? Yes. And why does that imply that it has to be zero? Yeah, so well, in particular, free energy is a state variable, right? It only depends on the state. And if I am in the same uh, state, by definition. But that, in principle, means that the difference between delta G3 and delta G1 must be the same as the difference between delta G bind and delta G2, right? The difference, that's just a simple mathematics. And delta G2 is zero. Because here I don't have any, here I just have water and here I just have a protein. I haven't really done, I don't need to do anything to move between these two. I have my protein and well, this protein is in water too. But the ligand doesn't do anything when I move between those. So that is by definition zero. So the free energy of binding actually corresponds to the differences growing, gradually growing this dummy slowly in the binding site. Sorry, gradually growing the ligand, not the dummy, in the binding site minus the cost of gradually growing this ligand in water. This looks really complicated. Why do we do it this way? What would be the advantage of doing this rather than pulling? No, an infinite if you could spend, if the simulation was infinitely long, the result would be the same. So the only reason for doing this, if this is somehow more efficient. So the problem with doing this pulling is that I was, I was moving the entire system, right? I was shuffling, when I, I, when I was pulling the ligand out, I was also pushing the water out, I was creating heat. Typically this ligand is a tiny molecule, it might have 10 atoms or something in it. So here I put these 10 atoms in a small cavity and just gradually grow 10 atoms. It's a very small and very local change to the system. So it's not really going to perturb the system a whole lot. And same thing if I just grow these 10 atoms in water, well, that's going to be closely related to the solvation free energy. It's also very cheap. You could even, some in some cases, people even just estimate this with the solvation energy. So the point is that both these simulations are actually quite cheap, while that simulation would be outrageously expensive. The other thing you can, so, that, so this way you can get it, and this is called the, the, the free energy cycle. And the whole point is that rather than doing the one expensive leg, we can do two cheap legs instead. But there are some way cooler things you can do that. In most cases, you're not interested in the binding free energy for a couple of reasons. Assuming that you could do a simulation where your error was in the ballpark of 
That would be a good simulation. And now you'd measure delta G here. The delta, assuming that delta G3 is 1,000 and delta G1 is 995. So this would be 1,000 plus minus 10. This would be 995 plus minus 10. So what is your free energy? Is roughly 5 plus minus 14. It's going to be the square root of 2 multiplied by that. So 5 plus minus 14, you don't even know what sign it is. So the problem with this, you frequent, when you try to calculate absolute binding free energies and compare different compounds, the problem is that you end up taking differences between two huge numbers. But that's bad because you really want to know what the binding free energy is, right? Or do you? What is it that you want to know? Take a step back. Why were we doing free energy calculations in the first place? Well, yes and no. Uh, but there was even a step before that. Because if you want to measure how well it actually binds, then you need to know what the binding free energy is. Compare is the keyword. So what is that we were trying to compare? Right, you want to say, if I add, say, an ethyl group here, was this better or worse? You don't care whether this is 900 or 500. All you care is about when you add the ethyl group, that does improve or deteriorate binding. And there are much, by using the same cycle, you can do pretty much the same thing here. So rather than, rather than trying to calculate the raw binding, Imagine that I have a receptor with a small mutation in it. Then I can look at it, what is the ligand bound to the normal receptor and the ligand bound to the receptor with the mutant. And here down, I just have the receptor with and without the mutant. Here I don't care about the ligand in the water. So what this cycle would give me is actually how much does this mutation influence the binding. Or same thing in this inhibitor. Assuming that you add a small ethyl group to it, or methyl group, that would be I prime. Then we would see how much better does I prime bind compared to I. So here you look, and this, now this is where it gets complicated. The binding free energy is a delta G, right? But here we're looking at, and that's a difference, but here we're looking at differences of differences, which is delta delta G. And normally, in 99% of the cases, that's what you're interested in. How does the binding free energy change? The binding energy is itself a difference, so what is the difference in the difference when you, either when you do mutations in the protein or when you change your molecule? And this is typically what, for instance, what Bill Jorgensen and others do. They take one small molecule that has, or a couple of molecules that have been slightly promising in the lab, at least the, the best one we could find in the first iteration round. And then you, you could even have a small computer program design 100 small random, not really mutations, but these are chemical alterations to your compound. It's not a protein, right? So let's change this small compound in a thousand different ways. And then let's calculate for each of these 1,000 different ways, based on the best possible pose we have in the receptor, does this improve or deteriorate binding? These simulations you typically run in much less than a day on one computer. So they're much, 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 much cheaper than absolute free energies. One week later, you're now going to have a hit list that says, for each of these 1,000 changes, do you predict them to improve or deteriorate binding? And then you pick the top 10 and synthesize those. And then, well, what usually happens is that in some rounds, you're really lucky. That in this round, you'd really correctly guessed how it bound and how it was placed, and all 10 are going to be better. Other rounds, you might be unlucky because all the, all the differences you introduced now cause the molecule to bind in a slightly different way, or you don't know what, but something happened so that none of your changes were successful. And then you're going to need to go back to the drawing table and see if you can do it better. And typically, this is what you would then do, is that you would go through a couple of dozens of iterations like this, and as you're gradually getting better and better and better, you would hopefully eventually have a picomolar binder or something. This is getting more and more. I would still argue that this is the cutting edge in industry. Um, 
the reason why we've started to do this more is that the computers are fast enough that you can afford to do it. It's better than docking. The problem is that it's still like 10,000 times more expensive. So what you're somehow trying to do is that can you create a funnel where at the start of the funnel you can have a very broad funnel and just go for screening as many things as you can. But as you're gradually decreasing the size of this tube, right, that as we have fewer and fewer and fewer compounds, can we compensate for this by spending more computational time on each compound? And that's where you could use the free energies. Uh, I'll skip this part of the distribution because it's not that important. Um, so how do we calculate this in practice, in a simulation? Well, that depends. One way is, of course, doing this pulling, right? But that's what we decided not to do here. So we're going to do this very simple thing. So you have a state A and a state B. If these states are super similar, so similar that the compound is going to be bound in exactly the same way, you can just take one state and change the parameters to the other state and rerun your trajectory or something. Because that would be, if the coordinates would essentially be the same, that they're not, the entropy is not going to change, then you don't need to rerun the simulation. Just take a simulation and change, if I had other parameters, that these other charges or something, where I've added my ethyl group here, how would it look like instead? This never works, but in theory you could do it. This would require you to have the same number of atoms and everything, right? That it's a very, very special case. But in theory, if there were no difference in phase space and if there were no differences in entropy, you would not really have to rerun the entire simulation. Oh, sorry, you would not have to do a separate simulation. You could just recalculate it with different parameters. And the point is that only the enthalpy would be different. There is no change in the entropy. Then you're good. It's awesome, but it's a theoretical case. The other thing that you could have is, and I think you mentioned this, Lorinus, that if you have a very small barrier or something, and if there are frequent transition between these states, you could just simulate it and count the populations. Like how frequently is this, if this can bind in two different ways, or if it's something very floppy loop or something, and if you're going to see a thousand transitions in a short simulation, just do the short simulation and calculate how much is in A and how much is in B, and then just use the Boltzmann distribution, R, T, L, and K, right? That works in some cases. But the problem is that in general, we're going to be in the third part here, that you have a large change in free energy and infrequent transitions. So the problem is that if the difference in free energy is large, if this is a 10 or 15 kT, the difference is going to be so large that even if there is no barrier between your two states, actually in particular if there is no barrier between the two states, what would happen? If it's, if, it's, if it's 20 kT, would it move back and forth? Right. So you, had, you would see after one nanosecond that it's 100% in the lowest states. After one microsecond, it's 100% in the lowest states. After one millisecond, it's 100% in the lowest state. If you could simulate one second, you might start to see some noise that it's occasionally in the higher state. So that this only works if you can simulate long enough so that we actually... What you call this in physics is ergodicity. I'm not going to ask about that at the test, but that if the time average is equivalent to the ensemble average. So that we're going to need the way of fake to calculate this explicitly, just as you did in the lab. Remember that mountain that if you never cross the peak, it doesn't help that you can determine free energies locally. We're going to need to find a way to force it to cross the peak. And there are some beautiful words in physics called Hamiltonian that I haven't introduced. Forget about the Hamiltonian here. This is really just our potential energy modify the potential energy in some way so that I can force it to go across the peak of the mountain. And then I calculate, well, now I'm calculating something fake, right? I calculate the, the thing on my forced system, but that's fine. Because I don't care about the free energy along the path, I just care about the free energy in the start and end states. So what I do along the path is up to me. Um, so if I can do any black magic, is divine inspiration is fine here, as long as I can then eventually calculate a good free energy difference. And I don't expect you to know these equations, but I have to have them to explain what I'm doing. So the Hamiltonian is the potential energy. This is all your bonds, angles, torsions, electrostatics, and van der Waals interactions. And to make things simple, let's forget about the bonds and torsions. Let's just think about electrostatics and Lennard-Jones parameters. 
So this is just the charts and the Leonard Jones parameters on each atom, right? And then so we have one set of charges in state A and another set of charges in state B. In state B, we can say that we have removed all the charges on the, uh, on the ligand so that the ligand is a dummy. It doesn't exist. And in that case, if there is some sort of parameter lambda that describes how I move between A and B, the free end is just going to be the derivative, the integral from 0 to 1 of dH d lambda with respect to lambda. I'm not going to derive this for now. And if we have no way, you can choose absolutely any coupling parameter. It could be a sign or whatever fun. What we typically always choose is to make this linearly, so that in one state lambda is 0 and the other state lambda is 1. And then I, when lambda is 0 here, I'm going to be in state A, and when lambda is 1, I'm going to be in state B. A completely linear change, which means that I gradually scale up my charges in the simulation. There are some nicer ways to do this, but we're not gonna, really going to care about this. So what you do in a simulation that's slightly more complicated than what you do in the lab, but not a whole lot. Either you could gradually change the lambda in the simulation so that I start, if I have a million steps, I would change lambda by one millionth at each step. But that leads to the same type of problem as if you were pulling, that you're gradually always changing the system. It turns out that it's much better to just pick 10 points. And it's actually, it's usually sufficient with 10 points. The reason why this works is that by default, if lambda zero is one, part, one, one side of the mountain and lambda one is the other side of the mountain, the simulation that runs here will never sample that state. The simulation that runs here will never sample that state because they're on different sides of the mountain. But when we gradually force them over here, each simulation here will sample a little bit of its neighbors. And that means that I can calculate the relative free endings. I will skip that part. There are some tricks that we need to avoid, to, uh, we need to use to avoid atoms bumping into each other, but I'm not going to do that. So what you would do in a simulation here is that, and again, there are automatic tools to create this for you, so you typically don't do it manually, that you have a, su you have a su uh, simulation that you're describing with two topologies. You remember those topologies you had in the labs, right? So one set to describe, I have all my charges, and then I have another B state where I've set all my charges and Lena Jones parameters to zero. And then I calculate these two simulations. This dHd lambda is something you get in the log file. And then I just integrate these numbers and boom, I get the free energy difference. This probably looks sounds a bit complicated, right? It is complicated because the mathematics is complicated. The beautiful thing is in a simulation, this is dirt simple. So what you do is that you use either tools or go to a web server and say that, you know what, I would like to calculate the binding free energy or the free energy of solvation for, say, cyclohexane. You will get all the topologies automatically, and you run this once in water and once in vacuo. This will already be in the energy files. Then you just run one Gromax command to integrate this, and you're going to get all these DHD lambda as a function of your lambdas. And then you will integrate these curves to get the differences. So all these, and this is not just Gromax, all simulations program can do this automatically for you. The neat thing for a free energy calculation, I think I, we're talking about less than one hour of CPU time here. So this is something we can do not just with one molecule, but with thousands of molecules. We can even use the Amazon or something. You don't need a supercomputer for this. This works really well. There are some slightly more advanced techniques to do this, but this is really how you calculate free energies in modern simulation codes. The point here is not that I expect you to be able to really derive these equations, but you should know that this is not, the mathematics behind it is hard. Doing this in practice is easy, very easy. Hmm? So that, but that's, that's, a, the, the che that's a good question. That's a, the cheating is essentially what I'm doing here. The reason why you generate heat when you're just pulling it out is because there are very large barriers. And all these, in that case, the barriers correspond to bumping into the waters and everything. Uh, 
So what I'm doing here is that I'm, I'm not literally crossing the peak of the mountain, but I'm digging a tunnel under the mountain. Because gradually, rather than forcing, if I'm going to pull the molecule out from the protein, I might need to force the entire protein to open up or something. That's a very expensive process. But by gradually disappearing the molecule inside the protein and then gradually disappearing it outside the protein, I literally never ever have to cross that part where I'm pulling the protein out through the uh, to the narrowest funnel or something. And that corresponds exactly to digging a tunnel under that mountain you had in the lab. Which is of course cheating. But if all of you are interested in knowing is how high it is on the left side versus how high it is on the right side, that's enough. It's not going to be enough to measure the peak of the mountain. The reason I'm saying this is that there is a surprising amount of simulations in the literature where people show that they can use large scale simulations, they can show the binding. If you're in a pharmaceutical company, you're not interested in that. Well, it might be fun to know a little bit how high the barriers are and everything, but at first approximation, you just want to know what the binding energy is. So free energy calculations are much better than just doing the brute force, trying to simulate the entire binding and unbinding. There is another way that we can define. So this works great if you have small compounds you're binding, but there is another very simple way to estimate free energies. And that's something called the potential of mean force. I think, I'm not sure, you, did you introduce this in the lab? You might have, but you, uh, you probably didn't think about it in this way. So what is a force? So the definition of force is just that it's a negative derivative of a potential. Um, well, it should be negative there too, but it doesn't matter here. So force is the change in the potential with respect to unit energy. But on average, an entire long simulation, and I'm not, this is actually, a, it's a fairly fun proof, but it's hard. The average force in a state over an entire simulation, sometimes we, even if it's the same state, Sometimes the force is going to be positive or negative, and the average force is actually the derivative of the free energy with respect to coordinates. And the difference is in a long simulation, the reason why this is the free energy is that on average in the simulation, we also get the entropy effects in here, right? So while if you just pick frame, frame 14, that force is going to be the derivative of the potential energy in exactly those positions. But if you look at the molecule in the state where it's bound, for instance, on average, if it doesn't change, the average force is going to be zero because it's happy there. If it, if it would, on average, like to move slightly to the left, well, in that case, the force would be pointing slightly to the left, right? This is a very deep uh, statement that averages of energies and simulations corresponds to the free energies, which I'm not going to prove. So in theory, if I just run a simulation and calculate the average force as a function of something, for instance, with respect to a coordinate or something, lots of different, pick 10 different simulations, and I calculate what is the average force in each of these simulations. If I integrate that average force, I get the free energy along those coordinates. And that's what you used in this umbrella sampling. We didn't call it potential of mean force anyway. There is one minor challenge. You're going to need what to, we're going to need to know what to apply the forces between because there's always, a force can never act just on one particle. It's forces are always pairwise, but I'll forget about that for now. And this is called a PMF or potential of mean force. So if I just, if I calculate the average force and that might take, each simulation might need five or 10 nanoseconds. And if I then calculate this and then I integrate that force, then I get an free energy that really corresponds to the average of the force. And that's why people call it the potential of mean force. It's not really more advanced or complicated than that. Uh, you, you want to know, or are you introducing this force concept? Because, for example, in the lab, is a way for us to then have the free energy. Mm -hmm. So remember what the difference, when we talk about free energy, free energy is intimately related to doing work on the system, right? And doing work corresponds to forces. So here I'm actually using that concept again. If I'm integrating the average force, that is the energy. But it has, the simulations have to be long enough that this really is the average force in that state over an entire simulation or something. I think this is going to be easier when I show an example. Uh, there are a bunch of different ways to do this. I'm not going to go into too much details there, but in principle, you can have one molecule here and one molecule there. 
and then have some sort of spring between them. And if I now force these to be at different distances from each other, this could be, I'm not sure what, uh, say two different ions. If I force these to be at different distances from each other and I calculate what is the average force at each distance, then I would get a curve that describes what is the average potential as a func of these two ions when they are either infinitely far from each other or when they get closer and closer and closer and closer. And this, so this is relatively similar to these umbrella samplings. By far the easiest way is to look at this when you think about a membrane. So if I have a small ion or something here, or let's say an amino acid side chain, if I take this amino acid side chain and force this to be at either out in the water or at different depths in this protein, right? Uh, sorry, in this membrane. Out in the water, well, out here, the force is going to be roughly zero. If this is a very hydrophilic compound, when I start pushing this into the membrane, the membrane is going to try to push this molecule out, right? But I can still force it to be in here with an umbrella potential, and I just measure how much would the force on it be. And what I would then get back is what is the free energy of having this out in the water would be roughly zero. And then somewhere in here it would be very positive because it's bad, and then it would go down again. So here I would get a curve along one dimension that how expensive it is to insert something in a membrane. This works really beautiful when you have a simple reaction coordinate. So the reaction coordinate in this case would be the z-coordinate, right? It's not as obvious if you have something like a ligand bound to a protein, this would correspond to pulling the ligand out of the protein, which would be bad. We're not going to do that. Uh, let's see if I... Uh, I thought I had some examples here. Oh, yes. Sorry. You know what? I'm going to... I'll jump back to the other slides after the break. I actually had a talented student who did this a couple of years ago. Remember that problem I showed you with the apparent hydrophobicity scales? That was a bit strange how things inserted in membranes. And we could measure that biologically. So we measure what is the probability for different helices to insert through the translocon or not. And the free energies were much lower than we expected in from physics. So Anna actually uh, was a PhD student here some 10 years ago. She actually did this. She set up a bunch of very simple systems. And then she forced amino acid analogs. So this is just the side chain part of an amino acid and forced that to be at different depths, um, some 100 points or so across these very small systems. And then she measured what is the force required to keep it at this position. Uh, sorry, this is a small plot. but So what you have here, all these black and white points, they correspond to measured forces. What is the force, positive or negative? And then when you integrate those forces, you get these blue and red curves. The only difference is that one of these have been symmetrized because the membrane should be symmetric. So you see arginine is very expensive to insert in the middle of the membrane. Alanine is cheap. Glutamine is, well, somewhat in between. Histidine is relatively expensive too. So she could measure with physics what is the cost of inserting this in pure bilayers just with lipids. And at that point, you can start comparing these two scales that what is the in vivo hydrophobicity scale versus what is the, uh, the physics-based hydrophobicity scales? And sadly or interesting, depending on what your point of view was, physics is still true when you do it in a uh, computer simulation, which is good for physics, but we couldn't really explain the results. So what Anna then continued to do is that she went on to show that what really explains this is that in real membranes, you have lots of helices and everything. And in particular, right next to this translocon, if you're putting an amino acid here, sorry, the analog right here, and just pull it to the membrane very close to the translocon, all these helices will stabilize it so much that you get beautiful free energy curves that are much lower, and that would agree roughly with in vivo hydrophobicity. And this is a later work, but I don't think we ever published this, actually. But this is just an example that you can even calculate how expensive it is to pull different types of amino acids through the inside of the translocon and show what happens on the very inside, inside the small funnel or pore here. Um, this is just to give you a taste of the, uh, what you can do with potentials of mean force. I will spend another five minutes to go through the errors because then uh, we will go back to the research after the break. Sorry, this is the slides that I should have had in a different order. So the problem with all these simulations is that as beautiful as they are, Computers can only give you numbers. 
There's this famous quote by Pablo Picasso, that the computers are useless, they can only give you answers. And this is sadly the problem here. So the result you're getting now, you're sitting and doing this computationally and your result is minus 23 kilojoules per mole. Is that good? What is the quality of that simulation? Right, so 23 is just a number. We have absolutely no idea how good or bad that simulation was. This might have been a simulation that's way too short. It might have been a simulation where the protein unfolded. At some point, you're going to need to assess, is this something? Well, basically, you're gonna now going to have a major presentation to the CEO of the company next week. And based on your presentation, they're going to decide whether to go ahead and synthesize compounds for $10 million. Hopefully, you should have some, because you're basically putting your job on the line here, right? If you're going to recommend that to do this, you should have some pretty darn good confidence that this is a good binder, is worth going to market. Not just it might or might not be, is not good enough. So we're going to, and this is sadly one thing that's not really specific to free energies, but people are missing a lot. Uh, we are really bad at assessing accuracy. Not just in simulations, it's just as bad in experiments. So there are a couple of things you can do in simulations. Um, Actually, anything that has to do with free energy. If it takes five kilojoules to go from state A to state B, how much does it take to go from state B to state A? Physics is reversible. So if you add something in there, you should be able to go, oh, sorry, here we're, here we're removing it and here we're adding it. By definition, these two should be the same but with different numbers. No matter how you do your simulation, you should always be able to do the opposite simulation and you should just have a difference in sign. When you do this, you're not going to get the same result just with the difference in sign. So it's very common that if you start, let's say that I start, let's see, if I have two states A and B and B really should be five kilojoules per mole lower, and then when I move it from state A to state B, I only get a difference of three kilojoules per mole. Why? It's stuff that I brought up earlier today. Let's see, do we have a pen here? Huh? Might be, um... No. Oh, I'll do hand waving, I'm pretty good at that. So if I have a state A here, zero and the state B that's minus five. Typically when I move there, although I would expect, hope to get minus five, in practice I'm not gonna get that. I'm always gonna get something that's higher, so minus three. Where did the two extra kilojoules per mole go? Heat, yes, because there is some friction. Any finite simulation will generate heat. But that's fine. Um, so then I am now at minus three, and then I go back to zero. So that I would expect this to be a difference of five. What will frequently happen is that I get heat in that direction too, right? So I'm gonna have five, but then I will lose two in heat too. So I get minus three in one direction and plus seven in the other. And this is called hysteresis, so that's in theory, I should be back at the starting point, but when I go back and forth, since you've generated heat in both directions, you do not get back to the starting point. Can you use this in some smart way? Can you factor in this to your like, equations? How could you factor it in? No, that's hard because you don't know how much heat you generated uh, or friction or just moving the system around versus anything else. But when do you expect to generate most friction? When you're moving forward or backward? Why? I guess just picturing... So is there something, is there something physically special with forward? So the laws of physics don't have a sign, right? So it's not more likely for something to happen in a, well, depending on, if it's a very specific system, uh, there might be a difference. But the first approximation, we don't know. 
And if we don't know, let's just assume that we generate as much heat going backward and going forward. And if half the error was in the forward direction and half the error in the backward direction, then I can just average these two, right? Because I know that if I started at A and then I went to B and then I went back to A and if now I was four kilojoules per mole higher, let's just assume that it was two kilojoules per mole in heat in each direction and then I would have roughly the answer. So that's cheating a bit, of course, because we don't know that that's the case, but you could, uh, you could estimate the hysteresis this way and hopefully get rid of a bit of the heat. You can all see that the slower you do your simulation, the lower the hysteresis should get. So if you're lucky, you should be able to extrapolate it. And this really comes back to anything, that any simulation or experiment will always contain errors. So what is an error? Do you know the difference between standard errors and standard deviations? This is where I would need a pen. Um, I would suggest that I take a break here. And what time is it now? It is, can I? 10.39. Uh, should we meet here at 11? And then I'll uh, go and get a pen, and then I'll just bring up this definition. This is something that you're going to be lots of use for you, not just in simulations, but in experiments too. And after that, I'll have time to talk a little bit about our research. All right, let's get started again. I talked before the break about estimating errors. So this is something I'm going to need to do on the whiteboard. And let's just see if we're really lucky now that recording will get the whiteboard. Otherwise, not. Do you know what a standard error is? Or sorry, standard deviation. Yeah. <laughs> so first, what is an do you know what an expectation value is? So normally in mathematics or mathematical statistics, you talk about a random process. And a random process is determined by something called the distribution function, which is just a mathematical fancy way of saying that, for instance, if you're drawing random numbers, and this is some sort of frequency, that is how frequently do I get the number, and this is just what number am I talking about. So this would be, a pro for argument's sake, let's say this is 10. So that the most common number would be 10 here but I can also get numbers that are smaller or numbers that are larger. And the reason why I draw this as a Gaussian is that any time you just add up a lot of random numbers, they will eventually get to a Gaussian. The expectation value is the true value that actually is describing this distribution function. And that's a mathematical concept. that they, if you write a program or something, you can define that. That is the number, if this is, say, the binding energy, this is the true binding energy. You don't know what the true binding energy is. So the expectation value, you occasionally use capital E or something, or occasionally an X with a dash over it. This is the true value, 10, exactly. Now, no matter how many experiments you do or how many simulations you do, you will never get exactly 10, right? So how could you try to estimate the expectation value? That's easy. So the average. Yes. So like if you just, what is, I'm not sure. Uh, a dice is a bad example if this is a normal distribution, but you just take lots of random samples and calculate the average. And the average is what I, you typically denote that in brackets like that. So if you just do one number, I might get eight. So with one number, the average is eight. It's not an awesome estimate of the expectation value. If I have a thousand numbers, the average might be 10.00892. Pretty good approximation. So the difference here, the expectation value is the true value what it is, and this is my current estimate of the expectation value. But remember that those, they can be, that, this can be really good or really bad. How good this is depends on how many samples you take. And this you probably all know instinctively, right? That if you take more samples, you're gonna get a better estimate. But what decides, what decides how, what values you can get? Because on the one hand, this is 10, right? But for one type of example, you might assume that you only get values between 9.99 and 10.01. So it's a very narrow range you get values in, typically. While in other process, you might frequently see values of 5 or 15. 
And this is what you describe with the width of this distribution. That is, how wide is it here, or actually how wide is half? And this you typically describe with a parameter called sigma, which is the standard deviation. So the standard deviation just tells you, uh, sorry, just to be clear, I'll, I'll actually erase the second arrow there, because sigma is half that. So sigma just means if you pick one random sample, what is, what is the expected spread in this? This is very common to see in the medical literature, that if you see a value that it's 10 plus minus 1, that 1 should really be the width here, sigma. And that's true, but 10 plus minus 1, that does not mean that all your values will fall between 9 and 11. If you draw this, plus minus 1 sigma here, the area here, do you know roughly what, what the probability is to fall within one standard deviation of the expectation value? 68%. This makes it somewhat scary with the number of MDs in particular who think that this means you will never ever get the value outside 9 or 11. Yeah, like only in one third of the cases. 95% is also good. The 95% measures something else. That measures 2 sigma. So if you go 2 sigma out, that entire rate would be, and now that pen is wearing out. So the probability to fall within two sigma for a single sample is 95%. But this still means that one value in 20 falls outside this. There have been some remarkable failures in the scientific literature when people do this. Because what they do is, uh, there's a famous XKCD about this too, that people test something and then they find that it's they get the, for instance, they tested they said whatever, a, a genetic trait or something. There was a paper from KI about this recently. You test something and then you find the result is negative. Okay, that's bad. Then you test the next thing. And then you find that the result was negative, no correlation. Okay. You test the third thing and you decide that there's no correlation. By the time you've tested roughly 20 things, you will have found one correlation. Or rather, you will have found a false correlation, right? Because if this is 95%, roughly 1 out of 20 is going to be false. 1 out of 20 times, you will see a result that falls outside this. And that's completely normal. So there was a paper from Karolinska Institute about a year ago when they argued that under some cases, genetic acquired properties could be inherited. <laughs> Very fun. But it did not work, was it? it worked mother, grandmother to son, I think. That was the only correlation they found. All other correlations were not statistically significant. And the problem is they done exactly this. They just kept looking for correlation. They had one out, if you, look at enough, if you look at enough properties, sooner or later you're going to find a spurious correlation. And that does not mean that it's a result. And it was very fun because it was a professor, Ole Hegstrom, who is professor of mathematical statistics in Gothenburg, completely debunked the paper and asked that it should be pulled. They still haven't pulled it. But it's a completely bogus result. It had nothing to do with reality. So why do I keep talking about these standard deviations? Well, it turns out the problem is that you never know what X is. This is the real binding energy, right? So what you want to know is how close is my current estimate to X? And this is what you want to show. You want to say that I think that my value is 10.842 plus minus 2. So that means that I think currently, based on my measurements, I think that the value, the expectation value should be 10.8 plus minus 2 point, well, 2.1 perhaps. So somewhere in that range, I expect that to be. Now this is a problem because, or as a problem, this is not the same as the standard deviation. The standard deviation is I just take one sample, it might be between 9, roughly between 9 and 11. The second sample I take is going to have what distribution? Exactly the same distribution, right? The third is going to have exactly the same distribution. 
the 9,946,843rd value I draw is still going to have exactly the same distribution. So the average value and the standard deviation I get for a single value, that will always be the same. That's the property of one value I draw. But this is different because here I want to say, how well do I estimate the expectation value? And this value is called something else. This value is typically labeled S for the standard error. And the difference here is that the more samples I draw, the better I should be at estimating the expectation value, right? So if you, by the time you've taken an infinite amount of samples here, S should go to zero. Sigma is constant. Sigma will never change. What you can show is that if all your samples are independent, S is going to be sigma divided by the square root of the number of samples. And this is not entirely trivial to show, and I'm not going to bother you with doing it. But the reason we're showing this is to get you to understand what the difference between sigma is, which is a constant of, that's a property of the distribution. And the standard error is whenever you're reporting anything, a binding energy or something, you want to report this as accurately as you can. And therefore, you want to get the standard error as small as possible. So sigma is standard deviation, S is standard error. And sigma is very easy to calculate. If I just, if I just keep drawing samples, right, I, I can count. And if I know what the, uh, I, so the standard deviation, I can simply get from their normal statistical formulas for that. But I basically take the square of the distance to the uh, mean divided by the number of samples and the square root of that. The only reason we're bringing this up, understand the difference between standard error and standard deviation. So then we'll go back to the slides here. Um, so what I really want to do, we want to minimize the standard error. Or actually, no, you don't want to minimize the standard error at all. What is the first thing you want to do? No. You want to know what the standard error is, right? It doesn't matter. Well, you could argue that. It's not the end of the world if, you, if your simulation was bad. Because you know that the binding energy you estimated is so bad, if it's minus 5 plus minus 2,000, you're not going to suggest to the CEO that you spend a billion dollars on this project, right? But if you know that your binding energy is minus 50 plus minus 0.2, you will never know it that well. But the whole point is that being good but not knowing that you're good doesn't help. It's frequently much more useful to be decent, but you know you're decent. So know your errors. And this has nothing to do with simulations. This is just as true in experiments. The only problem here is that these numbers, this is a theoretical beautiful case that every sample is independent of another sample. If you have a simulation, there's two femtosecond between the frames. Of course, they're not going to be independent, right? And it's the same in an experiment. If you're measuring on something twice, are those independent measurements? Probably not, because you're measuring on the same system. And that depends on what the relaxation and everything is in the system. You might need to wait 30 minutes for the next measurement for it to be really independent. It depends. There are two ways to handle this, which again, you do this in simulations or not, but they have nothing to do with simulations really. So if you have, you can split your data into blocks. So if you have a simulation with one million frames, and that, let's assume that that covers a millisecond, from one nanosecond to the next nanosecond, we might have correlation. But if I group these into blocks of 1,000, so each block corresponds to one microsecond of simulation time, the first approximation, I might say, well, microsecond two is independent of microsecond one. And I don't have a million independent samples, but at least I have 1,000 independent samples. This is something you might have done in bioinformatics too. It's typical jackknifing or something. And then you can use that to calculate the number of samples here. So that would be the square root of 1,000. Does that tell you something? The square root. Uh, forget about the formulas for now. So what's the problem with that square root? Assuming that your simulation is not good enough, you would like to, you have a standard, it's a, you might say that you have a binding energy of minus 10 plus minus 10. So it's not hopeless, but the standard error is so large that you can't really be quite sure about the sign. And you would like to reduce this, say, by a factor of 2. <coughs> 
So how, much, how many more simulations or how much more data would you need to reduce the standard error by a factor of two? Four. So if you would like to reduce this by a factor of 10, you're going to need a factor of 100 more data. This has nothing to do with simulations. It's statistics. It could be measurements, anything. This is the curse of all measurements, that it becomes, well, the, number, the amount of data that you need goes up as the square of what you want to achieve. And this is why it's surprisingly, I had a friend, uh, I still have a friend, it's called Zeb Doniak, who's a professor at Stanford. <laughs> it's a, and he used to say that he doesn't believe in all the statistics and everything. I, I don't say, I'm probably paraphrasing it here a bit, but when he looks at data, he wants to see the data right away, that the results just shines out and it's obvious. If he doesn't see it right away, he's not gonna believe it just because you go through a lot of statistical processing and everything. Now, this might sound horrible, in particular for Seb, who's a professor of statistics. Uh, but the point, or statistical physics actually, but the point here is this, is that if your data is so weak that it's just on the boundary whether you can see the signal or not, for this result to actually be useful later, you will likely need a factor 10 lower error, and then you're gonna need a factor 100 more data. But if you have enough data that is a really strong signal, you will likely see it right away. So that doesn't mean that you should forget about statistical processing. Statistical processing is very important to actually prove you right, right? But the point is that at some point you're gonna to need to be able to, don't forget your gut feeling. Being able to prove you right is important in a paper, but to decide, do that back of the envelope calculations, let's see, is this realistic? And if you realize with two minutes of paper and pen calculation, I'm gonna need a billion times more data. You don't go out and start simulating. The whole point, you realize that this is never going to work. I need to think of something different. And you just saved yourself 10 years of work. The other thing that you can do is that this blocking is a bit stupid because I might actually have more than 1,000 units of data here. This depends on how quickly these curves fall off and the correlation. There are lots of mathematical ways to calculate this. So you can calculate autocorrelation functions that describe how quickly, whatever number we have, how quickly it loses its memories and how independent different samples are. The reason for showing you these equations is that you have a choice here. Either you can start going through these equations, doing curve fitting and Mathematica, and there is some brace that I forgot there, making sure that you use at least two different uh, fitting things here. There are lots of free parameters or you just run one of these, both Gromax and most other programs have a command that can do this automatically for you. So if you just have a time series of data, there are usually programs that can tell you what is the expectation value and what is the standard error. No, sorry, what is the mean? That is our approximation of the expectation value and the standard error. Excel has this too. So don't worry too much about it in practice, but the one thing you need to understand is the difference between standard deviation and standard error because that will help you a lot in life. And who knows, it might even help you from publishing some embarrassing papers that professors publish. No, but the reason, I mean, these are not assholes, right? That it, this is hard, and it's so easy to make a mistake. And these mistakes, 20 years ago, you used to have a statistician in every department that could help you. But the problem with computers now, in particular in this age of big data, Suddenly you can have access to billions of genome sequences. It's very tempting to just start doing your statistical analysis on it. But just be aware that it's so easy to make a mistake. So what, what should you do? Be serious, I don't, this is not a course of mathematics. This is not a 12 week course of mathematical statistics. I don't expect you to be experts on this. What, what are you gonna do when you work out in that company? Or when you're a PhD student there? Yes, but there are other things you can do. In real life, it's occasionally allowed to cheat. You ask somebody. You ask somebody who actually is a professor of mathematical statistics. Or, you know, of course, you can't keep running to the professor of mathematical statistics every week, right? But yeah, when you have this awesome result that you think of submitting to nature, send this manuscript to a colleague and see if do you know anybody who's really good at statistics and ask them to have a look at it and say that I'm not an expert, do you think this is right? And then explain what you did. 
And at that point, they might say, face palm, no, you can't do that. And that, yes, it's a bit embarrassing, but trust me, it's a hell of a lot less embarrassing than having this exposed to the world and having to retract the paper. So don't, the key thing with the statistics, understand the first reality check here, you need to understand when it's so difficult enough that it's actually time to ask somebody who knows it better. Even I do that. And I, do, I have a PhD in statistical mechanics, but there are things in statistics that I don't dare to, I don't trust my own judgment on it. There are lots of ways of doing this. But the, only, the only point of doing all these curves and everything, that this is really the difference between saying that something is minus 15 kilojoules per mole. That is useless. That is useful. Actually, minus 15 plus minus 10 is still fine. Because minus 15 plus minus 10 still says that it's a fairly good probability that this is a better binder. Just minus 15? Pointless. You have no idea what the spread is. And you, to sum it up, you could also argue that is kind of the whole point of doing free energy calculations, right? In docking, it's virtually impossible to get these standard errors. But here you can actually start to say how accurate the binding energy is. There are tons of caveats to that too. And I think that pretty much sums up what I had to say about free energy. I have a bunch of study questions for you there too. Uh, since this is your last lecture, I'm not going to go through this the normal way. And tomorrow morning, I have a meeting at KTH, but I have scheduled time both on, let's see, Wednesday and Thursday morning. And I actually just scheduled an hour, but that's, I will be here for three hours if we need it. My reason for scheduling one hour is that I will be around 9 a.m. I forgot what room it is, but I'll mail you about that. And the idea then is that for as long as you have questions, I'll be around. And then we can keep asking, but I, I won't entertain you. I will respond to absolutely anything you're asking me but I won't go through anything with talks. I was thinking about, I, can actually, I do have a set of summary slides that it uses at some point in the course. Considering I recorded the entire lectures, I don't, the summary slides are just, I've taken slides from all the other lectures and I go through them fairly quickly. I don't think they're particularly useful for you, but I could, I can actually make a link to an old uh, version of that if you want to. The other thing that I figured you could want to talk about is I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how we're gonna do this at the exam. And then if we have time, I'll talk a little bit about our research. My idea with the exam is that I'm going to have two parts of it. Um, so the first part will be a bunch of very simple, not multiple choice questions, but questions that you should be able to answer with at most one sentence, frequently just one word. And those questions are pretty much just going to be taken from the, uh, all these study questions. So simple stuff that can, uh, do you know the course? And you will pass the exam if you just have those right. You won't even need to have all of those right to pass the exam. And then the second part of the SAM is going to be slightly longer questions where you actually have to reason a bit and think a bit, um, not things that are obviously just taken from the slides. Like some of the questions I've been asking you here in the mornings and everything that say, if you work in a pharmaceutical company and you're tasked with doing something, how would you do it? Those are not going to be quite as obviously right or wrong, but it's going to be a bit testing how you can integrate things. And if you want to go for the highest grades, uh, that's where you want to, then you need to do those too. And they're not, possibly not on the easy questions, but on the more advanced questions, I might, we will include some of the stuff from the labs too. So I'll make sure that Bjorn and Ari is around it probably both uh, Wednesday and Thursday to ask questions. Rather than you asking me questions now, I think I'm gonna take a little bit of time to quickly, very quickly, uh, there's 20 slides, but I won't go through all of them in detail, to just not so much make ads for our research, but show how we and others use this type of things in modern research projects. So this is just one rather arbitrary research project where we use free energy calculations a lot. And that has to do with these ligand gated ion channels that I've showed you. I won't ask any questions specifically about our research on the exam, but again, the concepts all go back to the other stuff we've done in the course. So for me, this, this is a great old slide by Sidney Harris, who used to do cartoons in Scientific American. Uh, and this is kind of the story of our research life, I feel. It's a really a pain when you're in this no man's land between physics and chemistry, but it's also very fun. Because if you want to do research, it's a long time, it's more fun to do research on the white spots on the map. So this started as an old project some 15 years ago when I was a postdoc at Stanford. And I had this crazy, literally crazy anesthesiologist, sorry, I should use. Uh, show up and become, oh, he wanted to model this ligand gated ion channel. Yeah, apart from the fact that there is absolutely nothing, there, is, there wasn't even a structure available. Even the Unwin structure wasn't published until five years later. We had some rough ideas about the alignments and I had just been 
he had been auditing a course where I was TA in bioinformatics. Uh, and so it was one of those things that it's crazy, it's never going to work. But he was insistent that we kept working together and this developed into a great research collaboration and friendship. These channels are fun because they're so intimately related to lots of human culture. Um, this, do you know what this is? This is ethanol uh, from, the uh, from Babylonia, I guess something. So it's ethanol is the oldest drug known to mankind. We've used and abused it for 4,000 years. Uh, nicotine is another slightly, slightly more modern drug, but it's also, very, it's also fairly ancient. Benzodiazepines, very new drugs. They all hit the same receptors. At one point I gave this lecture in a monastery on the topic of sex and drugs and rock and roll. So, um, propofol, um, one of the most widely used anesthetics in the world because it's cheap, cheap and efficient. And you can recognize this milk white compound because it's an emulsion, so it's lipid. It has to be dissolved in lipids. And that goes back to these uh, first instance of anesthesia. That was obviously not propofol, but ether and Edward Abbott. So both ours and Ed's interest in this case was that we were interested in understanding what happens in these ligand-gated channels. And again, people knew, we know quite a lot about them from a functional point of view, but there were really no structures available. And the other thing, and I'm not sure I might have used this slide, the other strange thing that was also known experimentally that they were so promiscuous that they can either inhibit or polarize the membrane. They can lead pretty much any type of ion. There are just two changes in amino acid down here and one amino acid you remove. And then you can turn an anionic into a cationic channel. And in particular, we were very interested in these anesthetics that I spoke about before. And that has to do with this Meyer Overton hypothesis that they're not going, just going into the membrane, but there actually are specific binding sites in these channels. Very much related to drug design, but it's not a plain the type of drug design that we mostly spoke about uh, today and last week was the plain one, right? We have a drug that binds to the primary binding site, the ligand. So this is rather a drug that acts allosterically. If this drug is bound, it amplifies the effect when you bind the real ligand or agonist, kind of like a transistor. When we first started out, we knew almost nothing about these channels. We spent a lot of time building models and everything. The cool thing is that the last few years, there are now a whole range of these different structures. This was August last year. In one issue of Nature, there were three new structures and they've kept coming since then. Um, there are, let's see which one. No, there's, there's, even, even since then, there is now a cryo-EM structure, like the facility, there's a cryo-EM structure of the glycine receptor, which is really cool. And I guess we're gonna, we're gonna see the GABA, the heteromeric GABA receptor in a couple of years. We're trying to get it too. We'll see who succeeds first. But what you can do with simulations, even of very simple and plain homology models based on the bacterial channels that we started out with, and over the course of roughly a microsecond or so, you get beautiful results where you can see, here I'm just showing one sphere, but this is actually an entire ethanol. And we start from red and go to blue, and it moves in here through the membrane. It reaches the binding site here where it spends several hundred nanoseconds, and then eventually it can diffuse out again. So this is just one example. And we were very happy with this binding site because this was right next to some of the very important uh, residue, func functionally very important residues. So we were, we published this and we were super happy that we have identified these blue binding sites in particular. And we show that this were interacted perfectly with all the serine, res serine 267 residues in particular that was so important. If you knock out that residue, it's no longer going to bind ethanol. This was a fairly simple project, but it's also typical in the sense that a, a neat way of using simulations is to understand something conceptually. We know that what it does in lab, we know roughly what it did uh, functionally, but you have no idea exactly how this works. And in particular, if you want to start mutating this binding site, there are probably at least 20 residues around this binding site. And if you just start mutating them randomly, well, it's going to be pretty hard to predict whether that's going to increase or decrease the strength of binding or if it's rather going to have an effect of the uh, structure of the protein. So it's very common both for us and others to use relatively short simulations simply to understand binding. Kind of, again, the other thing I mentioned in a drug design company, just sitting and looking on the screen, how would this bind? And if you would like to create a better drug here, could you get something that also interacts with this rest? You create a small extension of the drug that's slightly larger. Basically try to fill out the binding site and do this, well, three-year-old kid puzzling and getting something that binds 
as good as possible. From our point of view, we were very happy with this because this blue side sits right between the subunits and this particular channel, well, not the prokaryotic one, but the glycine receptor, which this is, we predicted, well, we predicted that if you bind the molecule here, it's going to push the subunits apart, which would open the channel a bit, which is what you see experimentally. It opens easier when you have these ligands bound. We were super happy. But sometimes your closest friends keep your friends closer, but your enemies closer. No, um, Pierre Jean and Marc, they're very close colleagues, and I worked with Marc for several years, actually. This is a co-crystal published roughly a year, half a year after our work or so where they had managed to take the prokaryotic protein, GLIC, and co-crystallize it with, let's see, I'm fairly sure that's propofol. Could be this, no, that must be propofol. Propofol here was bind entirely inside each subunit, and this would have been awesome had it not been that my team, we just bet our entire bank and scientific career on having binding up. Uh, I've been wrong lots of times. Being wrong is not a problem. But what really troubled me with this is that it's one thing to be wrong. It's one thing to be wrong when you don't expect to be wrong. Because this was one of these cases. We had beautiful expectation values here and small standard errors. So it's not just, you know, if in one simulation you see that it might be here, that doesn't tell you anything. But we had very strong quantitative data that we really expected it to bind there. And we so couldn't explain what happened there. That's, I think I have the, yes, I still have that joke. At some point, I hear that at this point, it's time to stop simulations and rather do experiments instead. Uh, but to quote another great scientist, Donald Rumsfeld, there are known unknowns and unknown unknowns, right? Um, and in hindsight, there were a bunch of mistakes we did in this study. The first one is that we're doing, there are too many variables that we could not control. This is an homology model. We have no idea how good that homology model is. The other problem is that GLIC is a channel that is inhibited by ethanol, while the glycine receptor is one that's potentiated by ethanol. So the problem is that this is the structure of GLIC, but we were not really modeling GLIC. We were modeling the glycine receptor. So at this conference, uh, Pierre Jean, uh, he, even, he, even, he gave his talk after mine. He was very clear. He said, well, you know, in theory, there could even be two binding sites. And at that point, I felt, well, yes, he's just trying to be nice. Uh, we entirely had a glass of wine together afterwards anyway. But the take home message here is that when there are too many unknowns in this equation, you have no idea where we went wrong. So the first thing we decided to do is, you know what, let's stop doing this. All the functional data that we and everybody had was primarily on the glycine receptor. So we teamed up with a great postdoc uh, in, uh, from Austin who is studying Glick directly. And Reba is actually coming here. She's going to start uh, working here in June. Uh, so at that point, we decided to start doing electrophysiology on the bacterial channels that had pretty much been neglected until then. And I, I'm not sure how much I talked to you about this, but this is very simple. You order frog eggs from Germany. They cost roughly one euro cent a piece. We get them in a package, uh, and then you just inject some DNA in it. You might see these very narrow glass pipettes here, right? They're maybe 10 to 20 mic uh, micrometers in the very front there. And then you inject, say, two nanoliters of DNA. And then you put it in an incubator, which is just a fridge, for a couple of days and let it incubate at uh, 12 degrees. And after those three days, there should be 99.9% .9 of all the membrane proteins on the surface of this small egg cell, this uh, frog egg cell, is going to be my membrane protein. And when you do this, we can measure it. And again, with a similar setup, we have these two pipettes. We use one of them to adjust the voltage and the other one we measure the current. And then you get very simple curves like this. So this, at pH, so this is a pH gated channel. So at pH 5.5 it opens, and then we try it again. At pH 5.5 it opens. And this is pH 5.5 where I also have methanol added, and then it opens stronger, and, and then it opens stronger. And then I go back to not having the methanol, and then it opens weaker. So here I can really show that methanol potentiates the channel. And the funny thing that we can show is that methanol potentiates it strongly, ethanol potentiates it just a little bit, but the second you are at propanol or stronger, you inhibit the channel. You turn it off instead. What is the difference between ethanol and propanol? Uh, 
it's just one ethyl group, right? It's, they are all aliphatic alcohols. It's, it's exactly the same series of compounds. And it's something that you hardly never see this. It's, it's also beautiful that the longer the alcohol gets here, the more it inhibits. So from propanol there and all the way down to necanol, stronger and stronger and stronger effect. So there is something strange that happens that depends on just on the size of the chain here. So suddenly you just, it's not just that it changes the effect, you literally switch sign of the effect. And you can actually show that we can make some mutations in this channel that uh, in particular one residue called the number 14 residue in one of the small helices facing the pore where we can increase this effect. This is 400%. I think we have one that's 800% even. So that appears to be super sensitive when I replace the phenylalanine. Let's see, yes. There's a phenylalanine far down in this one of these binding sites. So what we were actually able to show both in experiments and simulations is that there really are two binding sites. So the cool thing in the wild type, and this is based on a computer model, in the wild type you have this large red binding site, and this is a bacterial channel. Uh, and by default that would be the only binding site you had in a bacterial channel. But when I do these mutations, I make the channel, this was not random mutations of course, I take the bacterial channel and mutate it to look more like the glycine receptor, more like the human channel. And when you do this you open up a second large cavity because an alanine or cysteine is much smaller than a phenylalanine. So now we've opened a second binding site. So what happens likely is that the very short alcohols, they can fit in this blue cavity and that cavity opens the channel. But as you make the lar alcohols larger and larger and larger, they can't fit here, but they will fit here and then they will start to bind here instead. But in this case, you can fit much larger alcohols in the blue cavity. And you can actually show this with simulations. I'm not going to go through the details there, but uh, you can actually show that if we simulate the wild type glick, we get exactly the same binding as we do in the experiments, which is a bit of a curse in simulations. Once you already know what the experimental result is, people in simulations are really good to prove that that is what they get in simulations too. <coughs> Sorry. But what we can then show is that if we do this mutation again, still in the bacterial channel, then we get binding in both sites. And this is exactly what we see, that with these mutations, we make the bacterial channels behave like the human channels. Then they're actually potentiated by alcohols all the way up to hexanol. And just as much as I was muttering about the experimentalists in December 2010 or so, six months later we decided that we love experimentalists um, because there was Ryan Hibbs and Eric Go. They determined the structure of a much, much more advanced channel, a eukaryotic channel. It's, it's essentially a human. Well, okay, worm, but um, C. elegans. Um, no, but it, it is a eukaryote, and this channel has a similar type of pharmacology. It behaves similar to the human channels. And the cool thing is, in this X-ray structure, you actually see an uh, antiparasitic agent, ivermectin, bound right between the two subunits. Ivermectin. Did you hear anything about that? Last year's Nobel Prize, um, because it's one of these agents that had been used in the, the antiparasitic diseases. Not related to these ion channels, but it's a bit fun. It's a bit fun when you start to see these molecules show up in Nobel Prizes. But on the, the other part, well, we got a bunch of nice publications out of this, but we still had this nagging feeling that we're really good at predicting things once we know what the result is. And we really wanted to show that we, we really understand this binding, if there are multiple binding sites, we should be able to really predict binding based on simulations first, design something in the simulation that I want to do, get the channel to behave in a different way, and then after that show in the experiment that it actually behaves that way. So what we want to do is we want to try to design allosteric modulation, change the way the channel is modulated. But rather than doing this with ethanol, we want to do it with real molecules. Um, this is another anesthetic, desflurane if I recall correctly. Very common that uh, there are lots of fluorides and everything on these molecules that it causes them to bind better. So we decided to try this very simple molecule we had again. So this is the wild type protein. I'm not going to show the entire protein here. But this white here is one subunit and gray, gray is the next subunit. So in this case we had a structure. So here we started out not by doing simulations but doing docking. So we took all the compounds we wanted to test, and in particular we also took a bunch of experimental compounds. 
And the reason for doing that, we already have an X-ray structure of what, how propofol, for instance, should bind. So the question now, if we knew, do this docking without giving the computer program the information, will the computer program be able to find the docked post? So that's a positive control. That's also something that sadly the people, I was about to say that people forget about to do it in uh, simulations. Sadly, they're increasingly starting to forget about doing it in simulations. Remember to have positive and negative controls in your experiments. Um, this small dysfluorin molecule, we found lots of poses. And the point is docking is fast and sloppy. So I don't really care about which, which pose is the highest ranked or anything, but among the top ranking ones, this was the pose that we had in the crystal structure, and we found some things that were very similar to this. So that, that made us reasonably happy that if I just try to dock in things in this large cavity here that we have defined, we appear to reproduce things that uh, we had also found experimentally. And here we have the gray part here is this big phenylalanine, and I can certainly try to force things to dock in that other cavity that's really too small. And you can probably see already here, right, that we're going to bump right into the phenylalanine. This is going to be fairly bad. You can do docking with flexible side chains. And in that case, you can force the phenylalanine to push out so that there is slightly more room for us. But even here, you can almost guess that this pose is not going to be very good. But here we're just hand waving. We have no idea how good or bad very good is. And then we can do exactly the same thing, but we take that phenylalanine and mutate it to an alanine. So now we just have that there is no side chain there whatsoever and we do docking first inside each subunit and then between the subunits and here already here you can imagine that there's a little bit more space there this we did purely with docking but once we've done this with so what we get from docking is a bunch as a collection actually i think it was 10 or 20 potential poses because there's one going to be one pose when the ligand sits there. It's another one when it's rotated 30 degrees. Maybe one where it sits one nanometer higher up. So that you get, a, you get a whole forest of slightly different variations there. They look roughly the same, but they're not going to be identical. But what we really want to, to be able to design this, we want to be able to say, how good is it to bind here versus how good is it to bind here? Uh, can, I, can, I base, can I use this mutation to control whether it wants to bind? It doesn't matter that it can bind here if it's still better to bind here. So the question is, is this binding site best or is that binding site best? That's going to determine the behavior of it, right? So it turns out that there are slightly more modern ways of doing free energy calculations nowadays. And I'm not going to forget about this slide. Um, this is something I had from a recent talk. The whole point is that there are really beautiful automated ways to do this. If you, if you ever find yourself in a situation where you want to do this, look up a tutorial for one of the programs and they will tell you exactly how to do this. Same thing here, lots of mathematics in the background, but in practice, it's all hidden in the program. So what, was, what type of simulations did we want to do when it had to do with free energies? We wanted to use these free energy cycles, right? So in particular here, we wanted to do this, take a protein and gradually disappear this desflurane in the protein. And then this has to do with a protein in a membrane surrounded by water and everything. So it's very large systems. And then I have to do the same thing, take desflurane in water, but gradually remove desflurane in water. It can be for uh, cancer, yes, uh, that's one of the reasons. Um, and, uh, and, uh, but of course, that depends on the models. If you have very small differences in free energy and everything, the water model can be very important. And then we want to take the differences between those two bars, and then we get the effective binding free energy, the affinity. And now there are lots of bars here. Let's look at the black bars first. The black bars here correspond to the wild type. And here we measure a free energy of binding in kilojoules per mole. And let's say in the wild type, and this was the bacterial protein, then we love to be bound inside each subunit, roughly minus 22 kilojoules per mole. But we can also bind between the two subunits with minus 14 kilojoules per mole. And do you see the standard errors there? They are tiny. So it means that there's definitely, you can argue exactly how large those standard errors should be. There might be some things we don't see here, for instance, if the protein starts to move and everything. The whole point is that the differences between these two bars is significantly larger than the standard error, so the difference appears to be statistically significant.
So this says a couple of things. So first that it says that it's best to bind inside each subunit, which is good because that's also what you see experimentally, right? In the co-crystal, we saw it bind inside the subunit, which is what I thought was wrong in our homology models. So what we do see here is that simulations reproduce that beautifully, not only that it can bind there, but between these two binding sites, that is the, the one that is best in terms of physics and free energy. Do you see the difference between docking? This is not an estimate, this is a calculation of it with water and everything. But on the other hand, we also have minus 14 or something. Well, it's, let's assume that it's 10 kilojoules per mole. You can also bind between the subunits. So does it, won't it bind in both places? So what should you compare 10 kilojoules per mole to? Yes, uh, so that's a good idea. Uh, there's one thing, of course, if you ever have a physicist, it. so what, how many kT is this? 2.5? Get your units right. 2.5 kilojoules per mole. The units are really important. <laughs> uh, so if 10 divided by 2.5, so this is 4 kT. So if you look at the relative distribution of that state versus that state, it's going to be e to the power of 4. So it's going to be roughly about 52, between 50 and 100 or so. So this, I think, virtually all molecules are going to be here. Once, once in a blue moon or something, you're going to see a molecule up here, but virtually everything is going to be down here. This has to do with that these differences do not appear to be huge, right? But because KT is so small, when things are, and 4 is starting to be significantly larger than 1, you're going to have almost the entire population bound here. The funny thing that these channels are known for having very strange hill coefficients. Um, and to make a long story short, this has to be that in a normal simple system, as you increase the concentration, you just expect to see more and more and more and more binding. Uh, actually, I'll come back to that in a second. Um, but this will mean that eventually, as you're starting adding more and more and more, eventually you will have saturated all these binding sites. And what will happen when you've saturated all these binding sites? Saturated. Then it will start to bind there, right? A, hey, this is first class, but if first class is full, you will have to accept second class because at least it's negative. Black curve for chloroform here, much smaller difference here, but it's the same relative sign and for now all I care is about relative sign here you would probably guess on like a quarter about three quarters binding here and maybe one quarter there well we take this mutation we've just mut mutated a single amino acid they trade places so suddenly with this mutation we're now saying that it would be better to bind between the subunits than inside each subunit the difference here is not gigantic the difference here is starting to be gigantic so what I'm seeing, what the simulations are predicting here is that suddenly it would be better to start binding here between subunits. And it's only when this binding site is full that I will start to bind inside each subunit. So what we had postulated and what I, oh sorry, I might not have been entirely clear with that. My guess, and this was a large, bold guess we had at the time, could it be because all these channels, there are also difference between eukaryotes and prokaryotes that they're either potentiating or inhibitory, right? Could it really be so that we have one of these binding sites, this one in particular, inhibiting the channel, but this one would potentiate it? This would really be like having an on button and an off button in the channel, which would be pretty cool. And the cool thing is that that is the case. So if you take desflurane on the wild type, desflurane inhibits it, and then we take desflurane on our designed protein, just what one amino acid, this fluorine now potentiates the channel instead. So this is really starting to be some very strong, again, I would still say that this is strong circumstantial evidence. We haven't really proved it yet. That's what we're working on now. That the second bindings, there are really two different binding sites. Oh, sorry, by the way, this works for an entire series of different compounds, um, which is important because had it been one compound, it could have been a mistake, right? 
but it really appears to be the case that we have one binding site between the subunits that potentiates the channel while the binding site inside each channel inhibits it. So what Reband uh, we are trying to do right now is to systematically mutate this binding site to show can I selectively knock out the binding site so that it's a channel that can't be inhibited for instance. And um, there are a bunch of complications here that both we and others uh, are struggling with. But I would argue that this actually still holds. Uh, there are separate potentiating and inhibitory binding sites for these channels. This is potentially super cool because this might enable us to design better anesthetics. So the problem with anesthetics, and I might have mentioned this before, that it's not a problem to sedate you. You're young, healthy, and everything, you're going to be fine. But the problem is that the elderly a patient gets, and if they're uh, sick, maybe overweight, high blood pressure and everything, it's simply hard to keep them alive. And then during a recovery, you have all these anesthetics wearing down with different rates. So what this might enable us to do, to literally have a pair of compounds, we use one compound here to sedate you deeper, while if they then want to bring you up to make you slightly more awake, we could give the other compound. So in theory, this would make it possible to fine-tune anesthesia way better than what we can do today. And then you can have fewer of the other drugs to try to compensate for these drugs, which again, in theory at least, would make it possible to operate on, pa on patients that are more elderly or more ill. Ed's dream is to administer an anesthetic. He has designed himself at some point, which I'm not sure will happen. But, uh, Hopefully, well, if we do succeed, I hope I have a hand in designing it. The other things that you can do with these channels is that, remember how I said that you have an agonist up here, you have the allosteric site down here, and all this interacts with whether the channel is open or not. So we've had a number of students in the group show that you can actually reproduce this in simulations. So if this is a glutamate binding channel, so that if you do not have glutamate bound, you have a very high free energy barrier. But then when you add glutamate, and particularly if you add glutamate to all subunits and run longer simulations, the free energy for the ions to pass, it actually goes down and down and down. And here we're down to 10 kT, which is still a bit too high. I think this should be 3, 4 kT. But we can actually show how the allosteric modulation works. And if you have these mole both molecules bind, we drop the free energy. And we not only do you see the channel opening geometrically, but we can actually see that it opens in the sense that it reduces the free energy for ion passage. This is beautiful in a simple simulation setting. The only problem is that this is not how it works in reality. All we can do in simulations this far in these channels is that you pick a beautiful simple channel, which is a alpha subunit. That's why it's called GLY-RA, uh, glycine receptor, the alpha subunit. One, two, three, four, five alpha subunits. That's how we see them in the X-ray structures. That's how we normally do simulations. That channel pretty much doesn't exist in your bodies. If we forget about the glycine receptor for a second and look at a receptor called GABA, which is possibly, well, I think one of the most important receptors in your brain, there is an alpha subunit of the GABA receptor too. There is no GABA channel in your body that only consists of alpha receptors. There is a beta subunit too that looks almost the same. There's a few differences in the sequence, very much. It's a different gene. There's an alpha subunit gene and there's a beta subunit gene. So now I'm going completely crazy. Why am I bothering you with this? Well, this is partly to tie up the course on bioinformatics. Do you think this is important? <laughs> if you knock out the beta subunit, you can't sedate rats. They're no longer sensitive to anesthetics. <laughs> and we've actually been able, to, not we, but others have been able to show that the anesthetics bind in the interface between the beta, from the beta to the next alpha subunit. We have no idea why. It's just that, that appears to be, we don't, we don't even know exactly how it binds there, because this is a channel where we don't have the exact X-ray structure. That was the beta subunit. There is also a gamma subunit of this channel, and they, this is by far the most, for the gamma butyric acid receptor, this is the most common form you have it of it in the body. There are other special differences between these subunits, whether it's sensitive for benzodiazepines, these receptors won't even work without cholesterol in the membrane. We have, so some way the cholesterol will gonna have to bind to this receptor. We have no idea how it does that. All we know is that if you put it in the membrane without cholesterol, it doesn't work. Which is one of the key differences between eukaryotes and prokaryotes.
There is actually a delta receptor too, uh, a delta subunit. We haven't worked on that. Uh, it's not as common as that is the most common form. So there are four different subunit types. And if you think that is difficult, that is a horrible lie because there are at least 17 different subunit types of this expressed in your brains. The difference, we're talking about a handful, 10 to 20 residues out of 500 that are different. So tiny variations. So that if you just look at bioinformatics, any, any of these channels are going to have 90, any of these subunits are going to have 90% sequence identity to another. So they're beautiful if you want to build homology models or something, right? But it's still, there has to be some key structural differences here that give them different properties. We know almost nothing about this. And what people have done, and now we're heading out in, widely into speculation territory, but it, nature rarely does something without having a need for it, right? And of course, it costs you something to have 17 different genes that we need to control. So it's likely that the specific expression of all these different genes and the subtypes are related to different cells having different properties. The cells we have in different parts of the brain are different. The cells I have in the brain are different from the ones I have in my spine, are different from the uh, peripheral nervous system and everything. So these channels exist everywhere, but depending on what channels we express, they will likely give the cells slightly different properties. Not just that, depending on how much of the channel I have expressed, right? You're going to have a cell that responds better or worse to the particular GABA receptor. So this is also something, just as we spoke about the um, fetal hemoglobin and everything, gene expression levels will alter biological behavior. Now that leads to some very interesting things that unfortunately are not this. I'll give you the simple story first, if you remember that this is not true. So these channels are so related to addiction. What do you think happen if you, let's say that you have a normal healthy nervous system and then you start drinking lots of ethanol. So ethanol will on average potentiate most of these channels. It will make them easier to open. What could you imagine that the body would do? Don't express them so much. Exactly, you don't need to express so many channels, right? So what now happens if you stop drinking ethanol? So all these withdrawal behaviors, and the, the sad thing is that this is not true. Uh, it's much more complicated in practice. Uh, the point I want to mention is that what's amazing is that many of these diseases that we've historically thought of as psychiatric diseases or behavior diseases, they are very much biochemical. The way all withdrawal symptoms, uh, well, if anybody has had a hangover on a Saturday morning, right, you feel that it's definitely physical, it's not just in your mind. Sadly, uh, there are people that have done lots of investigations where they've tried to study expression levels in alcoholics and everything. Um, I don't think that people have really found any patterns. Nowadays, you can do all these temporal uh, genomics and spatial genomics to express things as function hundreds of different nerve cells. They do that a lot here at SciLife Lab. This is very much cutting edge. So instead of sequencing one human cell, you're now going to try to do full genome sequencing of, say, 600 uh, cells close to each other in different parts of the brain or something. As we collect more data, I bet we're going to start to find some of these patterns. But for now, we, have, we know almost nothing what the difference between all the subunits are. And this is just one of these channels. There are hundreds of them in the body. Uh, and I think I will stop there. Uh, there are a bunch of people. Oh, this is, this is research. I'm not this behind this. It's all the people in the lab in particular, and Cecilia and Reba at U Texas Austin. But if there is one recommendation I have to you when it comes to research and everything, go into the brain. This is. Well, first, it's sexy stuff. Second, it's interesting. Third, I think this is where the future is. Uh, because it's one of those. The problem when it comes to choosing research topics, it's so easy to pick one of these fields that either I or some other lecturer have spent three lectures talking about, right? And you know all the details. But why could I spend three lectures talking about it? Because it's an area we know very well. Those are not the best research topics. So some of this, I can't really spend more than a slide on this because we, well, we don't really know. There have been some papers published, but the results weren't really that strong. It's unclear. We don't know yet. Uncertain, uh, doubtful. Those are the keywords to look for when you want to choose PhD projects that people haven't done research. It's easier to do, it's easier to do discoveries that people haven't already discovered. I think I'll stop there. We have 10 minutes or so, right? No, we don't. We have three minutes. Uh, do you have any questions for me?